Perfect. Um, what's today's date? Today's the fifth. So uh, welcome to the Joint Information Technology Oversight Committee, um, December 5th meeting. Um, we've got, um, uh, Maria, did you want to do the introduction now or do you No, want to... we just informally okay. cool. introduce her. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Senator Chitman and Representative Sibilia, can you hear us okay? Getting a thumb up, a thumbs up from Senator? Yes, and I will be there shortly. Okay, perfect. Um, the first thing I'd like to do is um, we'll take a look at the Department of Motor Vehicles with uh, ADS and JFO. So um, if we could start with Lisa doing a quick review um, and then okay. um, we'll turn to ADS and DMV. For the record, can you hear me okay? Yes. Yes, ma'am. For the record, my name is Lisa Goff. I'm the JFO IT consultant. And we're starting with the DMB project for our discussion. The DMB project um, was made up, the modernization project was made up of two phases. Um, the first phase just went live. Um, and it, let's see, um, it's the, uh, it consisted of the vehicle services phase and phase two is the um, driver services, which started back in May. Um, so the driver services that they're working on now includes the driver's, driver's licenses and other identification and customer facing e-services supporting these functions. And so I'm happy to say the phase one of vehicle services, according to Commissioner Manoli, went live last month on time and on budget. And phase two is also on time and on budget with a predicted end date of what it is it July <laughs> August August 2025. Oh. <laughs> and what more can you say about a project that's always on time and on budget? Well, other than copy this for everything else. This is yeah, I love this project. <laughs> so, any questions about? It's so unusual, we're shocked. Well, this one is great because it's just a matter of my monitoring is looking at the um, project status reports that they make available to me so I can go and just look at them real time, anytime, and staying out of their way. Thank you. Um, Secretary and Commissioner, uh, do you want to come up together or? Okay. Of course, we're a team. <laughs> So for the record, Denise Riley Hughes, Secretary for the Agency of Digital Services. And for the record, Wanda Manoli, Commissioner of DMV. And uh, it's a pleasure being here today with all of you. I have put together um, a PowerPoint presentation that I am not going to walk through the details. Um, there's um, just, I think it's probably um, laid out in a very common theme for those that are familiar with um, the DMV modernization project. And I just want to say to you as um, someone who's been um, in government well over 30 plus years, um, this experience and the support um, that I have received from the legislature, from the joint fiscal office um, and the conversations around and our partners with ADS, you know, modernization has to be, um, you know, something that is holistic and you have to look at partners and you have to look at methodologies and you have to be looking at your staff and you have to have a vision for the future and you have to understand everything's not perfect. And I think sometimes we get into a place where we say, oh, there's that solution. Let's just buy it and do it. Um, it is a solution, but you have to, the opportunity um, that we really experienced was working on a methodology and, and we're thinking about how do we do outreach and what does it mean for our staff and how do you promote staff before you go live with the system so you can train them and you can pay them appropriately for the work that they're going to be doing as you're looking at retiring systems. Um, and. You know, and I say this with passion because I've been living it really since 2019, 
Um, and, you know, I think there's, and I just want to say this to this committee that you can't always assume that there's going to be savings in dollars because really you may be investing in your employees and raising them up, um, you know, and that there's a cost to modernization and there is a cost to the infrastructure um, and maintenance and operation. And, you know, so when you've been on an old mainframe system um, and you have really dedicated staff, but limited staff, um, you, we can't be efficient with our jobs and especially working with the legislature when, you know, you ask for a change or you look at a fee bill and I will just share with you, the legislature passed a fee increase that goes in effect in January. In the old system, um, the staff from ADS would have probably started three months ago and manually programming those fee changes, which are over 200. And then the employees have to learn what those changes are. With the new system, um, it's built into the operation of the system. And now it's just automated. You know, in future years, if someone adds a 20% fee increase, which, you know, I, I'm not here to talk about that, the system will automate it. And the staff don't have to know every single fee that you have laid out in the legislation. The system that they use is automated. The days of us for the vehicle services, data entry went down the stream seven to 10 times. When you went to the counter and received service, you as a customer said, hey, yeah, wow, I'm all done. This is great. With the investment that we've made, you go, but that actually went to the back room in processing and it was data entered over and over and over again. Then it went to mail and it was printed. Then it came back for quality control. We have eliminated those flows and, um, and that's, the, that's the investment in the efficiency of, of the system. So I do have a PowerPoint, but see, I, I apologize. I'm not apologizing. It's just, a, it's a really exciting um, opportunity. So if I can, I don't know if you all have the PowerPoint. Um, we do, Commissioner, and uh, post it to the website, but I can put it up on the screen, which we'll put it on YouTube if you want. Um, okay, and I'm just gonna highlight, I probably just talked about all of this, but there's a couple things that I'd like to highlight for you and then, really open it to um, questions and, and to the secretary. So we, we talk about vehicle services as phase one and driver services as phase two, but I would like this committee to know that actually in 2019, um, we made an investment of under $5 million um, to our commercial vehicle operations, which is where we collect all of the taxes, the field taxes, the um, the aviation, you know, field taxes. We do IFTA IRP, which is our international registration. It's a small group of people. There are like seven people in the team. Um, we actually invested and went to the Gentex sort of um, system, which is what taxes use. And we did modernize that. Prior, we went live in 2020, and that was really our pilot, our stepping stone in, in figuring out how do we do this. Um, we had every industry who registered their vehicle or filed taxes had to come to the Montpelier DMV office. And at that office, they had to file their paperwork and they had to pay their taxes. You couldn't do it at any other location. It was only done there. We put that whole system online. We have over 80% of our industry that now electronically files and they don't have to walk into a DMV branch office and they have their records and they have the information and everything is there. And, um, and, with, and we, you know, it's, and it's something we don't talk about that often, but I just, that's 40% of the revenue that we bring in that we modernized, but it touched a small group of, of individuals in Vermont. So that's where the journey started. <clears throat> then we moved forward with vehicle services, um, which we began in June of 2022, and we went live on November 13th, 2023. Um, one of the things, um, to Lisa's point, there's a methodology that we've embraced with the IT project and it's about investment of staff. 
um, with your partners, with ADS and with our contractors. And that investment really focuses that if you're gonna do projects of this size type um, and you want quality, you have to be working together. So we identified a location at Barry City Place. All of my staff, at one point in time, I had up to 40 people that were assigned there working through this project. It goes at different levels. ADS had a substantial amount. And our contractors are also there. And they were probably up to 20 employees. They move into our community. They buy houses. They rent. They invest. <coughs> and they're here for the long time. And that's where they work through the duration of that. Um, and we plan on staying at that location for driver services. Um, we really in, try to invest in train the trainer approach. So along with you have these systems and you have these solutions, you also have to look at change management and you have to look at how you're gonna invest in your employees. So we've done a train the trainer model. We've got some lessons that we learned from that. Um, and because onboarding is even different for us at, at DMV. Change management is you know, a word that we all use pretty lightly, but there are significant things that come out of really looking at your organization around that. And that's probably one of, from a leader's point, one of the biggest elements that you have to embrace because you have to be a leader at the top, you've got to encourage it, but you also have to find ways to help your staff adapt to the change. You know, I have individuals that have worked at DMV for over 20 years, and all of a sudden they are getting a new system that is going to have them process differently and think for them. And they have been sitting there for years going, wait a minute, um, uh, just a quick story. You know, I was walking around and I, you know, had an employee, she goes, I, I said, how are you doing? She goes, I need you to know I have severe OCD. And I was like, oh, okay. She goes, I am validating what the system is doing. That was her, I mean, she got through that, but you know, employees were honest, but that, I mean, there is such a change in how they have to do business. And everybody comes at it at different ways and different speeds. And I'm uh, right now saying, be patient, be kind. Everyone will get there. Don't expect immediate, um, you know, results that they're all gonna be at the same place at the same time because we all learn differently. Um, and the, I promised I wasn't gonna take an hour and I probably <laughs> will, I apologize. So the system replaces a 50 year old mainframe system. Um, it's, you know, it was image retrieval. We had this old point of sale. And so what's really important here is that our data took 15 to 30 days to be live, live for law enforcement, live for if you came in and did a transaction in Montpelier um, and you called the call center, you know, it could, and the call center would say, I don't see your transaction because it might take us 30 days to move that information downstream. Now, when we process on vehicle services, everything is live. As soon as you come in and you do a transaction, a registration renewal, as soon as that transaction is completed, that information is live. It's there, it's real data. We don't have this back room re-entering the data to make sure the information is, is direct and live. Um, the benefits, I'm on the next phase. Oh, you've jumped right ahead. So just on the benefits, I. I, I think um, that one of the biggest changes is beginning to end transaction, no matter if you um, do business online, if you come into a branch office or if you mail your transaction in, what you have um, is that um, that transaction is completed beginning to end. So if you come in, if you choose to purchase a, a motorcycle um, and you do a direct purchase, you're not going through a dealership, you have the title, you have all of your documents, you come into DMV, you leave with your title, if you own it, with your plate and with your registration. We do not mail those to you. 
we, again, that whole process on the back room has been eliminated. So we would give you temporaries, then it would go to the back room and it might take us 45 days to get you your title and 15 days to get your registration. And we may send you two sets of stickers because we had over 20 access 97 databases that didn't talk to the mainframe. So we're over processing, processing. So the important piece to you all about the modernization and, and my passion is the connectivity and making things function and operate. It's really difficult to run a department that brings in over $300 million of revenue and you don't have systems that don't communicate and you don't have real data. And this is the opportunity with our administration and the legislature um, that you've given this department. I, and if I could just share yeah, an stop experience me. that I had. Um, so I know it was a bold move, and I said that the last time I was here, for you to make a decision to shut down for four business days. It was a very bold move. However, it paid off in the long run because it was over a holiday weekend. It was really only four days over the course of two weeks. Um, I had a chance to go down to the Springfield location and the I wasn't, I wasn't expecting the excitement that I saw, but speaking to what you talked about, the instant outcomes for Vermonters, this is a location that's one of the satellite locations. All of the paperwork, it was because it was all paper, was getting mailed here to across the street and every transaction was being processed here. And so that Springfield office of those folks that are serving their own community members in Vermont were having to wait and tell them that they would have to wait. And now the looks on their faces where they're reimagining the impact of the community, it was, I mean, it was public servitude at its best. And this is how we want to see these projects happen. And so they were giving immediate access, immediate outcomes, and nobody was sitting and waiting. Um, so it was it was positive to see. So that was something that they shared with me. Yeah, and and you know, um, and I just you know, I'm so glad because we, I mean, that that you were there so you could experience what the the staff was experiencing. I know it's very difficult, um, and you all know that to say we're going to close down a department so we can transfer and convert data. It was the most important, um, and, and again, I, I thank everyone for the support, and it was part of our planning and communication. Um, and everything the vendor recommends in a methodology is the minimal. I chose in many places to increase, um, only because you have to allow for time. So I think they had a minimal recommendation of two days, and we went further because we, you know, we did conversion, we did conversion of our, you know, we had to do e-services, we had to do um, communication with all policing because everything became live. We had to convert all of this data. We had to test it. We were constantly in it. I mean, I know ADS did 45 mock tests of the conversion um, before we actually converted. And then there was, it was go live, go live. Then we had our staff in the offices. They weren't off. They were all working at different places, um, you know, and then we had them in on that, that Monday and Tuesday, and they were actually processing mail transactions in the new system. And what was wonderful about that is that that's where no matter how much investment you make in the system and your staffing, you're not going to get everything, right? There's going to be little glitches that come up. That was our window of time that we were able to identify if there were any other little things that we had forgotten. And of course there were, because not everything's 100%. But what the team did for two days is these small little glitches. We had our, our IT staff, our partner, our contractor, and our staff, they were in there fixing it. So when we opened the door to the public, we had worked out some of, of those um, bugs and it was just, it was a, a great investment. Um, these are just some testimonials um, that, you know, I, I mean, they're coming from staff, they're coming from dealers, they're coming from different people. And I just wanted to capture um, the experience is positive. You know, no, but everything's not perfect. We still have a little bit of backlog. Pre the flood kind of put us in an awkward place. Um, staffing 
and filling vacancies is is no different than what you're hearing from anybody else. Um, but overall, the experience is extremely positive. Um, and I just want the committee to know we also have an SQR team. Um, so as a result of this, you put together a really a new team, a new unit within your organization. And those individuals in partnership with ADS are constantly working on the system. Employees, when they use the system today and they say, you know what, this functionality isn't working or this isn't right, they are the ones who get to invest in the change. They communicate to the team, you know what, I keep processing a registration and this error is coming up. It doesn't have to come to me. It doesn't have to come to their director. It doesn't have to go up the food chain. It's leveled across, and that is just one of the most positive benefits. And that's you know how they make those changes. Um, the next slide is what's next: driver services, and um, this is the last phase. So this plan project is to begin. Lisa talked about it. Um, my staff are very enthusiastic. You will see that they gave us an exact date. I will tell you that date may float a little bit, but they are ready. They want to start and go live on March 18th and complete by August 18th. Um, we are in the process right now, even though we haven't put the team together, we have staff that are looking at policies and procedures, so we're preparing. Um, because there's a lot of preparation that you have to do. Um, we are going to be documenting our existing business process. And I know all of you are probably very familiar. That is the most critical role that you have the right employees in the room where you document everything that you do. And then you're really challenged with the COT solution. And that's where instead of customizing everything you want to meet your flow, you have to be open minded to say, here's the solution. And with this solution, we are going to look where we can get, get efficiencies and where we have duplications. And we should be talking to the legislature if we need statutory change here. Is that a rule? Is it a policy? Is it they? Is it shall? Is it um, may? And it's, um, it's really in-depth work. Um, what we're replacing is our, our, you know, our current credentialing system. Um, we'll still do off-site credentialing, but we're looking, what we potentially could be looking is right now all of our data is with our um, company that issues our driver's license. With this system, we can bring it back into the master data collection. Um, and then um, we're, we'll advance scheduling and customer queuing. We're going to retire the rest of the mainframe, which, you know, ADS has to keep going for us. But it will be connected to license suspensions, reinstatements. You know, we'll partnership with judiciary because all of our actions in that world are an outcome of what happens in judiciary. Um, and again, retiring the, uh, the databases. We will continue to explore mobile driver licenses. You've given me authority to look at mobile driver identification. Um, for me, they're really two, they're the same. It's, um, you know, I have to constantly, uh, you know, in representing the state and working with the legislature, you know, we have a population that does business differently than our old systems. And we have to be agile and we have to be looking at that. You know, I mean, I just, how many of you carry your credit card on your phone today? Some do, some don't. Um, you know, you can have your insurance on here. You can have your registration as a temporary if you go online. Um, if you travel to other states, if you fly, um, everything, not everything, but the majority of the population, because they choose to, and that's what's important. It will always be a choice. They choose to use the devices um, because they don't want to carry the paperwork. I mean, I still carry a portfolio when I fly. I still print my ticket, even though I use my phone. I still carry my passport, even though I have my driver's license, and I carry my old driver's license. But that's... That's, you know, that's me. There are people that don't, you know, they don't want to do that. 
Um, and the other thing is, you know, so there's, there's just so many opportunities for advancing. Um, and we haven't talked really about e-services. We've enhanced um, e-services. You know, when COVID um, came in front of us, um, DMV had to find a way to do business because we needed to support, you know, our residents and our businesses. And so we worked as a team um, and we added things to online. But I want everyone to know it was forward facing. The customer said, oh, yeah, OK, this makes sense. I can do this, this and this. But nothing in that transaction, everything was redone at a DMV office. So you thinking, oh yes, I'm here, this is great, I got this, I'm still mailing, but all of that information had to be entered. Our e-services is now also live. Um, that was one of the biggest changes that we did with, the, with this first project. And, um, and we expanded services and we will continue I want to tell you, I think in 2019, 2020, we probably had 200,000 transactions that were done online. Um, I haven't looked at the data in the last couple of weeks, but I know it, it's well over 350,000 transactions online. And that number just keeps increasing and increasing. So the more we make available, um, the more we're, we're serving our, our public. You're still gonna to have to come into a DMV at some point in time. Um, so we're not trying to close offices or do anything like that, but if we can provide services based on what your constituents want, um, what you know the residents of Vermont want, then, then that's, that's what we do. And um, we advance where we can, where we can advance. Um, the next slide, I'm not going through this. Again, this is for you all. Um, part of the methodology that we have to start doing is you have to really start planning. And so this is the org chart around what driver services is going to look like. And I just felt that it would be beneficial for you at some time. It just kind of gives you the breakdown. And then it identifies roles and what the responsibilities are. Um, these are minimum. So our partner is saying, look, you need at least one DMV. I'm going to tell you I will have more than one working on issuance because you don't know if people are going to be sick. You, you don't know if they're going to move on. You don't know if they're going to retire. But the more knowledge you can invest, um, the better off the project is. And that's the hardest thing about these is, is figuring out you know you're going to be delayed on something, but making that investment up front. Um, the next slide is um, the next slide is just the breakdown of um, we talked about the CVO, we talked about vehicle services, and now we're going to be moving through driver services. And then we truly will be in a maintenance and upgrade um, uh, process, and um, the what we. Um, bought with our contract is an automated automatic upgrade of any new upgrades that they make. Oh, that sounded wrong. Um, in that, you know, so over five years, as Fast makes an investment and they do a, a new core system, we automatically get that. Um, they are hosting our data in partnership um, with ADS. So that's a service I bought, but it was really the right decision for the state. I will tell you, we have the premium package. We made an investment in the DMV system and we made a premium investment. And there is going to be, so budget wise, as we go forward, everything's built in and that will make a difference, I think, over the next five years. And then I think there's one more slide. So I get very excited. Um, I'm going to turn this over to the secretary because I invited her and Secretary Flynn to my office today. This was today. Um, and you did. And I didn't know what I was going to experience. But uh, Commissioner Manoli invited us to have a demonstration of a kiosk system that could sit within a state building that could allow for self-service of um, driver services, registration services, and at the end of the day, really any type of self-service, but kickstarting it as a 
as a next phase in the DMV project, especially as you started sharing the wait times with some locations that have three hour wait times for constituents, whether or not it's, um, you know, the walk-in service availability and staffing. We could dramatically reduce those. And I think that one of the targets that the provider who conducted this demonstration that was compelling to me was re reducing the amount of time that you would actually spend at the counter by 30% by being able to do self-service. And um, I greatly appreciated the forward looking so that we weren't doing a set it and forget it with a, you know, we've made the modernization and now we move on, but really looking at the experience of the Vermonter and what the Vermonters need and looking at that wait time and impact and, and that self-service, because these could be 24 seven if, if the building was open. Yeah. And, you know, we are doing 80% our appointments, um, people coming to DMV, about 80% are scheduling their appointments. Um, we're serving in 15 minutes or less. Um, but that other 20% are, are walk-ins because we're not going to refuse anyone. And those walk-ins, depending on staffing, depending on which location, depending on the type of transactions that are taking place at a DMV, um, you could experience a 15-minute wait or you could experience a three-hour wait. And we, incur we tell them, we actually try to take their transactions um, and process when have them leave. We encourage them to go online. Some people, they want to wait. And, um, but it's still, to me, that's a long way. And I think for your constituents, it's a long way. For these kiosks, uh, you said they could go in any state building. Would they also be uh, allowed uh, to go into like a local PD or local town hall, something like that? That would be the determination of, yeah. of the project team. You know, one thing that we have to do, um, so online is allowing people to do business 24 seven at their convenience. You may work a third shift. You may work at the hospital that has two 12 hour shifts, right? You know, um, you, you can do certain things online. So these should be accessible um, and they should be available and it's 24 seven. And the wonderful thing, again, I get excited, so that's why I'm gonna let the secretary leave this. You know, you can build um, the, the systems, the kiosk systems that are out there after you do all of your security piece. You can actually um, build other services, state services. I don't know if you wanna to touch base on it, um, you know, in, into the system. So my goal is DMV and I, I'm happy to be the platform. I think that the secretary is seeing even more. Right, we, looking at it from a, if there's an entry point where I've gone in, I've renewed my license and I've done it through the kiosk, but the floods just happened. We could easily put a component in there saying, have you been impacted by the floods? And now have an additional touch point for state services. So now you, you almost look at it as a state service kiosk that could exist, but we do need a, we do need a pilot. We right. do need, you know, a, a way to drive the, the initial integration point and driver services seems to be that area and registration as well. The other piece that was compelling too was the verification. Mm -hmm. So because of the advancements of technology, you have systems like this that can do um, visual verification of the user through the ID and the photo that they're going to take to make sure you are who you say you are too. And without storing, without doing facial recognition right. and storing that data. Right. So it's almost if you travel through TSA now and they are real ID compliant and they're scanning, you know, you're standing in front of that, that little thing, they're scanning your face and it's actually doing a verification of your passport or your license that you gave them. They're not stored, well, I can't speak for TSA. Um, but, you know, for us, we did have facial recognition at DMV. Um, that ended um, when our administration um, began. Um, I don't think people were aware, but we were actually doing biometrics, facial recognition every time you came into DMV, and that's why you had to renew your license. And you couldn't, you had to take off your hat, and you couldn't wear glasses. What this system does, it's no different than you, again, setting up your phone, um, it's it's a verification, um, and you did the questioning on. They don't store the data. 
it's not collected it's, it's isolated or it's independent to the state system only there is secure network connectivity and we're going to have a deeper dive you know with with these platforms to understand the security behind them but the biggest piece was that it's not a independent cloud system that was retaining state data it was moving into the core state system that we had access to which is compelling and I think, you know, the biggest opportunity for ADS and having that platform is building from it, but but not us, but so. Okay. Or did you want to wait until the presentation for questions? Well, um, I think I'm okay. done. <laughs> so just on that point of um, our facial recognition being stored, I think I heard you say on the state system. So no facial recognition is stored, no. it's the data. The data. So basically the verification data would store on the state system. I don't know enough about the platform. This was just an initial first time hands-on opportunity um, to touch and feel a particular kiosk solution, um, but that's something that we'll be very critical of. Can you um, talk about the, um, just kind of compare and contrast the differences between in security concerns or, or uh, pluses and minuses um, around security for cloud, storing in the cloud versus storing so in our system. When I, my reference to the cloud storage was if a particular vendor stored and accessed that data from their own cloud environment and not the state's instance and that's something that we need to be cognizant of on whether or not there's any kind of let's call it data data sharing unknown data sharing in these instances and it's not isolated to cloud by any means it's really about transactions so we just need to make sure that if we are going to have any kind of secure personal data that it retains within state systems and the state's environment and the state's control um, this, this kind of speaks to some of the data privacy dialogue that's happening across the state right now that's critically important is um, we don't want to both intentionally and unintentionally be sharing personal secure data. Um, we want to make sure that we're controlling that um, and protecting the monitors. So let me just make sure that I'm clear on what you're saying. So what, you're, uh, what we are retaining from this verification of facial data is being retained in a state system. This, nope, so this was a demo. We do not own the system. We did not purchase the system. Right. This was a opportunity to see the art of the possible mm -hmm. of the current DMV investment that's been made and the driver, the driver services phase that's going live, that there are next step service offerings available to, Ver to Vermonters that Commissioner Minoli is looking at. She brought me in, he brought in uh, Secretary Flynn as well, so we could see what was available. Nobody is subscribing to this today. So we definitely still have to do a quick, uh, I mean, a pretty deep dive on both the security and the technology behind it. But as far as the potential experience for Vermonters around self-serving, especially in this space where there's high wait times, there's high inavailability if you're not available during the hours of 7 a.m. to 4 p.m., right. you know, Monday through Friday, to do these types of things. This was an option that is being researched at the moment. And who is protecting the data for phase one that we're collecting? That's vehicle data, right? So, so for phase one and phase two, we um, have an agreement. I'll, I'll let you address that with um, FAST and with ADS. So we have our, the, the state is it's state data in a private cloud hosted solution that is an instance that is managed and retained by Vermont. Do that for a sixth grader, <laughs> please. The company who we bought the product from hosts it in their private data center, private cloud environment. They have an instance dedicated just to Vermont that our state resources manage. But the no. actual protection is taking place yeah. from our contractor. Um, no, it's taking place from us okay. and it's also taking place from our standards. 
and it is taking place and they have to they have to adhere to our standards as well. Um, it's basically following the analogy of somebody else owns the building. To introduce yourself. We, I'm sorry, for the record, I'm Mark Holmes, I'm Chief Technology Officer for ADS. Um, it's similar to the analogy of renting an apartment. So someone else owns the building, we rent an apartment, we have our own keys, we can we can lock the apartment, and everything in there is ours. Thank you. Thank you. Um, that was a simpler example. Related to parts of the That's related to the overall system. Um, I've got uh, another quick one for privacy. Um, you talked about the e-license on the phone. Um, one of the concerns I've heard uh, people express is if they use that, they've got to unlock their phone to display their license. Uh, is there a way that the um, the phone data can be secure and still display the license? Yeah, there absolutely is. Um, and, you know, I'd be happy at some point to come back. So AMVA, which is the American Association for Motor Vehicles, um, it's, it's statewide and, and Canada. They establish best practices. So all states try to align um, with some of these. And they have a great video out there. You in control under mobile the way mdl mobile driver's license is being designed and built is you control the data that is shared and i'm just going to use you can basically set your profile up that if you need it for law enforcement you know date of birth address name whatever but if you um are going to use it for an id to enter um, because you're being carded, you can hide your address and just have your date and your name. So there are elements that you have to, you know, you manage. Um, with law enforcement, there's an app. So you don't have to hold, you don't have to hand over your phone. You don't have to, you have to probably bring up your license. You know, it's just like reaching into your wallet or your glove box and you say to the officer, I'm going to access my information. It's a scan. It's you don't hand your phone over to them. They don't get to scroll through your phone. It's a really in mobile driver's license in these apps. That's that's what it is. So again, it's education and it's training and it's introducing, you know, the technologies to help eliminate those fears because those fears. I wouldn't want to hand my phone over. Um, I, I mean, th this is my stay phone. There's, you know, I would not want to hand that over to someone, right? It's just as simple as that. Um, you know, so to answer your question, there are, I think there's a lot more that's out there for the protection of the individual and their personal information. Um, and, and it's about choice um, again. And, and that's what we were talking about. You know, if you want to, people totally trust their, their phone to put their credit cards on. I I wouldn't because I would probably leave it open or do something, you know, foolish. But um, there are, you know, individuals that, you know, they don't carry briefcases or satchels or wallets anymore. Everything is here. Um, and that is part of our population. And I'm not saying that we need to make everything that way. I will say to you as a commissioner, we have to continually evaluate serving our customers in every way. It won't be 100% scheduling because we're still going to have people that are going to come into DMV. It's not going to be 100% online, but I need to make sure that we have the services available for the ones that, that we can do online for those people. Um, we have people that would love to have a kiosk and, you know, I, we, you know, having a kiosk and thinking about the future and, you know, we get overwhelmed in the spring and in the summer with new registrations because people buy boats and motorcycles and everyone needs to renew. That's our high renewal time for any activity. If you think about our seasons and, and what we do. And so now you've got to come into before you just have to come to a DMV to register your boat. You can do that online and just think if you could do it at uh, the kiosk at midnight because you're taking your boat out. And I'm just using that as an example instead of having to fit into our schedule that we're open for operation, because I would rather have you register it. I would rather have you have it insured and and be able to collect the revenue that we need so much to support the other um, pieces of what our revenue does. 
I think it could be another avenue to, to buy the Vermont Strong Plates as well. Absolutely. And we sell them at any branch office if you're in need. Got <laughs> two. <laughs> well, you can have four. Go ahead, and then I've got another one. Uh, first, congratulations. Uh, this looks like a superb end result, and I'm very happy uh, to see this uh, looking back. And now I'm going to ask a hard question. <laughs> Uh, we always look forward to the things that work well and that do exactly what we want them to do and are, are wonderful achievements as this is. But what's hard, but what's also important is to look back because I know this isn't the first iteration of fixing DMV systems. It goes back and I, I would like to ask, what were the potholes? What went wrong? What were the things that were done that you found at some point, obviously your predecessor found, not you, uh, found were going on the wrong road in the wrong direction and had to be redirected and changed? What were the things that blew up in your face that if you had to do it over again, you would never do because you've now corrected it and done the right way? What are the lessons that were learned that we should make sure that other people who are somewhere in the system development process don't make those same mistakes. I love that process. So do I. And so would you like to go on mine? No, you go ahead and then I can talk about this project and lessons learned. So absolutely. You're describing my very first meeting um, in meeting Commissioner Vinoli. <laughs> um, and no, it was good. It was good because it was a lessons learned. I will tell you, I feel fortunate that I, this is my first major Vermont project in my position that I've been able to see go live. And it has set an expectation bar for me that I am bringing to every one of the conversations and meetings that I'm having as either the executive sponsor or um, project <coughs> for agencies to say, this is the foundation of, of well, what I would expect and how we should do it. If I could speak to one thing that I would have hoped would have been differently. And it did come up in some of the conversations that we had during the off time was looking at that business process change up front. Um, because that was a limitation. That was something that you shared with me and you did get it moving mm -hmm. after the project had kick started mm -hmm. and by force, right? And not everybody has that force. And, and I think that that could be a risk in future projects is if we, one, if we don't start that up front, but two, if it wasn't started up front, that it, without that strong business sponsor that you were to the DMV project, that, um, that puts these projects at risk. Because everything that you're hearing absolutely is technical change and there's a technology component to it, but this is all about people. So um, I really appreciate your close. I appreciate everything you said, but it is all about people. And, and just to add, um, you know, the lessons learned. I was talking earlier about methodology. There needs to, you know, there, there needs to be leadership expectations. And that's really what you're referring to. Um, and, you know, so I want to tell you, as I embrace this, even with the project that we started in 2019, um, lessons learned are really important. And it's not about the, the nuts and bolts of how the data is going to transfer, because I'm not an IT person. And, um, and my staff know it, and everyone chuckles about it. Um, you know, but I did lessons learned with the tax department. And some of you may know they went through um, a similar project, you know, I want to say like in 2012 or 2015, or I don't even know. I sat down with um, Commissioner Bolio, who at the time was the project business lead, and now is the commissioner of the tax department. And I said, talk to me, tell me what do I need to know? So you have to make that investment, Senator. Um, you're absolutely right. Um, I had that, I had lessons learned from the CVO, and I will tell you with this project, I have lessons learned that will change and flow into the driver's services. Um, 
And I'm going to give you a, a couple examples. We talked about change management, and I'm not using that word just you know loosely as as the catch term. Um, there's an investment in change, and using the business flow process, you absolutely absolutely say we are going to do this and you have to set policy and procedures and give clear directions to your team on your expectations and then you need to step away because if you're in the room they're going to do whatever you want they're not going to challenge each other but on that that business piece and one of the expectations is you have to use the solution and you have to align our requirements and our expectations to that you can't ask the contractor to build you a new system that works with your current workflow. And that is probably one of the most difficult, difficult things for people who are invested in the state of Vermont and our public service and our running programs. That it, it is, I, I know there were people that were just, they challenged the vendor, they challenged me, they were challenged ADS, it was frustrating. But they got through it because you have to have patience and you've got to support them and you've got to listen. And I have to tell you, as a leader, sometimes I just simply have to say, what is your recommendation? And I have to accept it because the other thing we know is in change, you all could change a lot and we're going to have to go in and change something. So change is every day. So you don't have to be you have to have your policy and, and that piece. And these are the big these are the lessons learned on on the systems. If you don't make this investment, what you're going to get in the end product is something that is going to blow up and doesn't process here. And that's, you know, the experience is, is terrible. The other thing that I just want to tell you is um, with this project was um, anticipating the work that these groups, you know, they came back to me with policy stuff saying this statute is outdated. It wasn't touched since 1963, and I'm not exaggerating. Um, and it does, and it says we shall do it this way. One of the things that I'm very thankful for, a lesson learned, is last year you gave me some language that allows me to work with this committee um, as we do driver services to bring sort of take act because when you're working through the process, I can't stop the deliverable. So I either have to make a really bad policy decision and build something we really don't need, or I need to have a relationship with my committees of jurisdiction and people that oversee that allow me to make change that aligns with systems that brings us efficiency. I think we are the first state that I am aware of um, that the legislature, you gave me this language, I, there are things I can't do. I'm not going to be over there changing fees or, you know, going crazy. But when my team is in this process that the secretary was talking about, and there's a significant roadblock, and because it says shall, we've been operating under May, or it's irrelevant today, um, you've given me, the committees of transportation gave me the ability to make the changes in the system, report to um, the Joint uh, Transportation Committee, and I believe, I'm looking at you, I believe there's some reporting or you're a part of, of, of that, and um, that's off session. And um, so I can keep advancing because there were some small things that I couldn't change in the vehicle services um, and take advantage of the system because of statute. Most things the committee of jurisdiction um, gave us uh, the ability and we were able to get changes in language to support the system um, while they were still developing it. So that to me is one of the most critical pieces. It's got to be a partnership um, and and trust. Um, so. I think that so lessons learned and we're rolling those forward and, and it's an excellent, excellent question because that's how we're going to keep building great systems. Right. You've got one more before we change gears. Um, cross platform data, um, the new system for DMV, does that communicate with other departments? For example, if somebody comes in and changes their name on their license. Uh, does that flow to the tax department so that they don't have to 
uh, have multiple touch for that. So that single user experience that you're describing is something that we are working towards with all of the modernization systems. So what I can say is the, the FAST system, the new DMV system is capable of doing that when we're ready to connect it into the other systems. Right. Mm -hmm. Any other question? Uh, yes. If I may, I heard about this on Facebook. Someone went on social media and said something positive about DMV, and everyone else was like, really? It's easy to use? So kudos to you for that. Thank you. You know, it's really not as antiquated as we're really not the sloths. I know that that movie did us in. No, no, we've heard of other systems that have a video on it. Not in the works. Um, I'm curious a little bit about the kiosks. Mm. Is, is that similar to what I would do if I were going to log in and renew something? Or does it have different features? that you're going to offer it on a kiosk that you couldn't do from home? Um, I think that it's the, um, it's going, you know, I mean, my vision is that it's very similar. Um, you would be able to renew your photo on your own at a kiosk, which you can't do online. Okay. And you all know because of between COVID and the flooding, we've extended the photos. Um, and we've worked on legislation and increased those dates. At some point in time with all of these extensions, um, and we do want new photos for a number of reasons. Um, you know, we will be overwhelmed with people having to come into a DMV because that's the only place you can do it. So the kiosk, um, you know, that's one of the services um, that that would be different. And and if I may, I just, you know, we were talking about it um, this morning um, before we started the, the, um, ex the experience with the kiosk. You know, we're serving customers in person, we're serving them online, and we're serving them um, through mail, you know, and now creating a kiosk. Um, that um, allows them to do beginning to end transaction and leave. So this doc, this kiosk that we looked at, prints your license as if you went to a counter, takes your new photo, um, will give you your immediate registration to, to put in your car. Not everybody has connectivity at home. You all know that. Not everyone has printers. Not everyone chooses to do business online, so it's another it's another way to deliver our services. And you don't need to take an, a deli number and get online, right? Is what you're saying? No, you don't. No, no, you don't. And if you don't have an appointment, my vision is we, you know, we will serve everyone. But if you come to the counter, because the appointment system is working, I know that you probably hear from your constituents where they didn't have an appointment and it's frustrating. 80% of our transactions are, are done by appointment. That number has not, that has not changed. Um, but if you don't have an appointment and just think about you walking into a DMV and there's a kiosk, um, not a Pac-Man kiosk, <laughs> but there's a, there's a kiosk and um, the person at the information desk says, yes, we can serve you. Would you just go over there? And then we have an employee roaming, working for three kiosks instead of one per person. So they're not denied their service. They're not going to a counter, but we're just going to have someone that's going to walk them through the kiosk. You know, we're not just going to leave them over there. They're going to leave with the same product. Thank you. A little bit of enthusiasm there, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's like self-serve checkout at that's, Price Chopper. That's right. Some people love it, some people won't, yes. but you can always get help. Perfect. Thank you. I appreciate you coming in. Nice to meet you in person. Uh, Thank and you. And congratulations on the project. That was Thank nice you. And the final product. Good. Thank you, Secretary. Uh, Secretary, uh, would you like to go to UI or ERP next? Let's do UI okay. next. I think Dustin has joined us from VDOC. Okay. It's, it's, um, Thank you. So what I'd like to do, if we could ask Lisa to just give a brief review, this is um, mostly so folks watching on YouTube can have kind of an idea of what we're talking about without having to go back and rewatch old videos, um, just to kind of summarize where we're at. Great. Okay, so just some background on the project itself. Um, 
This was originally, it started in FY22 with a request for 3.5 million for the portal piece, which is the front end piece for the uh, replacement of the unemployment insurance system. And then it was followed up with a request for 30 million in FY23 for um, really the, the replacement of the mainframe, the back end system. Now that's not where the project ended up, um, but first, um, what this would do is right now the unemployment insurance system is on a 50 year old mainframe with the applications that are anywhere between 30 to uh, 40 years old. Um, so this would whole project would replace that. The first iteration of this project was the development of an RFP for that front end portal piece. Okay. Um, but that was pulled when they realized that it would be difficult to find one vendor to do just the portal piece without including the back end mainframe piece. There would be just too much, you know, uh, too much of a disconnect between those two projects. And you also wanted to get a, a leading vendor with um, experience for this project. And I agreed with that decision. I thought that was a good decision. So um, a new uh, RFP was developed and put out there. Currently, the vendor has been selected, but um, they can't be named because the contract hasn't been signed yet. So we're not referring to the vendor name for that reason to respect the, the uh, procurement rules of the state. Um, this project, because of the cost, was required to do undergo an independent review, which it did, but there was some lag between the time the independent review was done. Part of it was due to, to flooding and the state's ability to respond over the summer to the, to the independent review. And I know um, uh, Secretary uh, Riley Hughes mentioned to me that there were some issues originally with the independent review that she really was pushing back and requiring some more information on this particular review. And it was also occurred at a time where there was leadership change at ADS too. And so, and with that, with the flooding, so um, there was some disconnect. Um, originally based on last, the last meeting this committee had, I was going to review this project because I did have the independent review and come back with our, the JF, JFO review of the project and make a recommendation to the committee. And just to step back for the, the 30 million, which was the second piece that was funded in FY23 for the main frame replacement, there were caveats put on that money at the time that once more information was gathered and at a later, later date, ADS would come forward with that information, including the independent review. I would do the review and make a recommendation to this committee on whether or not um, it was time to release the funds. And of course, that's, that's your decision. Um, and so at, I had followed, after reading the independent review, I had followed up with some questions to ADS and the Department of Labor. Um, but the responses didn't answer all of the, didn't provide me with all of the information I felt I needed. So I sent a note to ADS identifying where the shortfalls of information were. Um, some of, at least the ones that, the major ones that I identified up front. Um, and I did hear back from ADS with some additional information, but it was clear that I wouldn't have time to produce a review for this particular meeting and that we still needed time to gather more information. Now, I still, if you recall the last meeting when I gave a preliminary assessment on the project, I said, yeah, there's, you know, there's, there's information missing, but I, I don't see anything that's going to gives, gives me any reason to think the product, the project won't be a success. And as concerning it is, as it is might seem to not have received the information that I needed, I don't, I still feel like it's a matter of if you actually have the staff assigned to this to really just track down the information. I don't see this at any of any of what I've seen as a type of thing that's going to sink the system. In fact, I'm so optimistic because of the vendor that they found and their track record for this that I think um, this can be overcome, but we, we do need to gather the information. We need to make sure you have all the information um, that you need to make a responsible decision about releasing the funds. So, uh, and I think the only thing that um, I, I, that I think hasn't been really worked out is um, one of the comments I had was that we were 
some of the business costs weren't included in the project. And I think that's really important to understand project costs as a whole, not just the IT component. And they, I want to just be clear, there was, a, in my opinion, a sincere, oh, really? You know, so I, I, but I think it's something that we can work through. I don't <coughs> anything that we, we can't go through. So, so that's my assessment. And I know I communicated with the, the committee about um, not having the information and, and not being able to uh, make the review. So is there any questions you have for me before I turn it over to? Uh, just in terms of um, staff assignment uh, at, um, at DOL on this project, um, in terms of your interactions, has that been consistent? Are you consistently meeting with the same I've, person? Are you I've met earlier this summer, luckily, with Commissioner Harrington because it was before the flood and he had time. We spent a lot of time together just going over you know, how he would respond to the business and also mentioning the project uh, because of the similarities in the scope of the changes that need to be made uh, between DMV and UI and whether or not he had spoken to Commissioner Manoli and he had. But I do have concerns about the staffing because I know they have another project going on, the workforce development that had a, had a bit of a snag. And I'm concerned about, you know, the They've been very, um, Commissioner Harrington, when he was here last, he, he shared that it was, it was an issue. There is a problem with recruitment. And so I didn't, I haven't received the staff list or the stakeholder list for this project, um, which I think is important because you can't, you know, you can't start a project out without knowing who's working on it. And usually schedules have to be cleared. So there's any number of reasons why that, I mean, there are serious concerns that have to be overcome but I still think they can be overcome. And I think the strength of the vendor is, um, it's extremely important. And I feel very happy they were able to, that a vendor um, with this type of experience and track record did apply, uh, respond to this RFP, but we, there's still a lot that we need to do in order to be prepared to be successful because you know, I was a software vendor and I was responsible for responding to RFPs and going out and really talking with um, state agencies before we started projects. And one of the things I would assess is organizational readiness to see how much risk there was to us on working with a state that might not be ready to be an equal the partner that you needed to come on time and on budget and to work out strategies. So I see, I see some of those concerns, but again, I don't think there is anything that we can't be overcome, but they have to be overcome in order to be successful. So just to, I wanna follow up on that. And you know, certainly I'm interested in hearing the secretary once we get to that, I don't know how you'd like to take these questions and, and DOL's response to this, but um, in your opinion, um, does this have to be, does the project lead for this project have to be employee of Department of Labor. So in other words, could there be some creativity within the administration and assigning someone else to be the project lead? The project lead feels really, really important to but me in terms of accounting. You're talking, you're talking about two different things. Well, there are two different, you have the business lead and the IT lead. Um, so I think it's, you know, definitely an IT lead you can kind of make do with, you know, uh, somebody who's an experienced person coming in. But a business lead, you really need the organization to own the business requirements and they're changing. They will be changing. And just from reading the independent review, it's clear there is some of the similar um, opposition that, um, you know, Commissioner Manoli mentioned that she had experienced in her staff, which is a very human thing that needed to be addressed using change management. And for those where, you know, who haven't done a lot with change management, Think about it as um, it's just like this methodology where it talks about, for instance, here are the different types of reasons why employees can be opposed to a project moving forward, how it's going to affect them personally. We have genuine concern of how it isn't being done in you know the same old way that it used to be done. But it also it gives you strategies for addressing all those different types of reasons why things are opposed, people are opposed. So having a person on board that's really skilled in change management, which could be an external person, somebody new to an organization coming in, I think is important. 
but it has to be addressed and you have to have the presence of leadership within an agency like we saw with Commissioner Manoli. And so are you, ta- are you um, sharing with us concerns about business lead or? Uh, I haven't seen the staffing for, for any of it at this point, but that those are all things that I would will look at. And so are you making a recommendation to, you're not making a recommendation. No, I'm not. Because you didn't have time to review. But if you had had time to review, you, would you make a recommendation to us um, without if, a staffing plan? If I should we if, move forward with that? Well, I would have to see what the state's plan is because I think it's, it's there. They have the knowledge and the ability to know the resources that they have available to them to make that decision. And based on what they show me and having conversations with people, I might have an opinion, but I might not. I mean, meaning I might be, I might have concerns about it or I might not. Uh, but I think it's up to the state to make those decisions. I, I, and I don't mean to chime in if I could answer, we will be moving forward without a staffing plan. That, yeah, would, not okay. be, that would not be in anybody's best interest. Yeah. That feels really um, paramount. Yes. Me, um, in terms of accountability, understanding both the business and the IT, um, this system, you know, has had a lot of not awesome interactions with Vermonters, and we need to know that, um, and, and and awesome interactions with Vermont. Well, probably not awesome at this point, but uh, we really need to know that there's. Um, and you will hear that, and that's one of the reasons. I mean, I certainly felt empowered to push back. Mm-hmm. when I felt like I, I still had additional questions. Mm-hmm. And I have no doubt that we'll work it out and it does need to be worked out and we will come to you with, you know, those responses and assessments and, you know, definitely uh, a formal response up front. Um, so, but I still think this can be a good project as good as the DMV project, I really do. Yeah. But we just have to go through some more planning. I mean, we certainly, I, my history on this committee, and Senator Brock, I think, will recall this. I mean, I've seen um, some, you know, numerous changes um, on other projects that I don't think were to the benefit of that project getting done, um, our ability to understand what was happening, any kind of transparency or accountability for dollars. So I do want to flag this as kind of a key issue for me in terms of when we are asked to move forward, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, one last thing before I turn it over to you. Um, one of the most important things we can do up front is to have these conversations and work out the concerns and details because it makes for a smoother project and it's easier to have these conversations up front when you're both, you know, when you're both doing the planning on here are the things we'll be looking for. So I'm not surprising anybody. Um, and it gives the state the opportunity to respond and there's um, even in the time frame, you know, that was just last week when we were having these conversations, I suspect things have changed since then, you know, on this project. So I look forward to doing it and working with the, with the state and uh, sharing what I find with all of you. So. Thank you. Any other questions for me? I don't see any. Okay, I'll leave it to you. Thank you. Um, I saw Cameron Wood just drop off. I saw that as well. Um, so I know Deputy Commissioner Degree is on. I don't know if he wants to speak on behalf of the <laughs> Department of Preferred. There's Cameron. Oh, there's Cameron. I apologize. He dropped off. I just didn't pop back in. Oh, no worries. Hello, can you hear me? Can you hear me? We can. We were getting a little bit of echo there. Um, so uh, I'll I'll leave it up to you to Deputy uh, Cameron, uh, Deputy Commissioner Degree and Secretary, um, how you'd like to uh, present and then open it up for questions. Cameron, you're welcome to introduce yourself and share from the business side. Yes, ma'am. Um, thank you. Uh, first off, I apologize. I'm uh, had to leave Vermont unexpectedly for a family emergency. So I'm joining you from a lobby of a facility. So I apologize for that if you can't hear me or if there's a noise. Um, I just was wanting to address a little of the staffing comments uh, there. Um, So we have internally identified a project lead for the project. Uh, It is the Associate Director of Unemployment Insurance 
She has been with the department specifically in unemployment insurance for, I believe it's roughly 17 years. She has worked and led teams throughout the entire UI division, both on the finance side, the benefits side, and the tax side uh, as both supervisor and then subsequently a uh, division tax chief and now an associate UI director. So I think, you know, I, I feel confident in speaking for Commissioner Harrington that we are very comfortable with the business individual that we've chosen to lead this project. Uh, we are continuing to to work to backfill positions. I think that was one of the concerns that Commissioner Harrington mentioned uh, last time we were with the committee. We do have staffing challenges, and I, I think, you know, in today's environment, that's probably going to continue for the life of the projects. Uh, so we have six positions that we uh, have received from, uh, I think it was three positions from General Assembly and three positions we've uh, allocated internally to the project, and we're looking to fill those to backfill so we can move the subject matter experts that we've identified on our own team over to the project full time when it begins. So, um, you know, I, I, I think um, the secretary mentioned we don't have that staffing plan probably articulated out, uh, and that's something I think we're obviously happy to work towards if that is of value to the committee. Uh, but you know, I'm. I'm fully confident in the individual that we have leading the project, and I think I'm comfortable speaking for Commissioner Harrington there as well. And I'd invite the Deputy Commissioner to give his thoughts if, if he has any on that. I'm happy to answer questions related to that specifically. Yeah, I don't. I don't have a whole lot to add. I would just to you know just to reiterate Cameron's um, point to the fact that we're already working to move bodies and, and shuffle the the. Uh, the deck chairs around to make sure that we have adequate staffing. Also, if we identify the fact that we need more, uh, we will certainly be happy to come to the legislature and ask for those. I mean, the, the department is and has been committed to modernization for a very long time. Uh, I think the level of excitement to get the project off the ground and with the vendor um, is palpable uh, after a long few years through the pandemic and now through the flood. Um, we're Nobody wants to serve Vermonters better uh, than the folks at the Department of Labor. And we know that our um, our legacy technology is, has been a huge handicap for us. So um, we're committed to making sure we have the bodies. We've got we've got what we have now. And we labor certainly does not want to go into this shorthanded. Right. We want to succeed in this endeavor. Um, so if we need more help, plan on uh, hearing from us and, and, and getting that ask for sure. And I'll follow through that on the EDS side. We have committed dedicated resources to the project as well. So it probably is a matter of formulating that, um, that resource plan now that we're at that point in the contract negotiations. But we're, we had hoped over the last month that we would be at a point where we were ready to sign. And I think that we're very, very, very close to being there now um, that we can get that information over within the next few weeks to have final review on because we also don't want to delay. Right. Can any of the three of you point to any specific things that have uh, caused uh, the delay thus far? Just the flood itself has caused, I mean, we're still, we're still managing some pieces there as, as um, it put the contract negotiations on hold. Um, We're starting to see some relief from that, from a staffing standpoint. And we've also moved some folks over from ADS, uh, internally within ADS over to this side of the project to create some, some more focused dedication to. Yeah, that's, I'm really happy to hear that because it strikes me when you've got an agency that's kind of under so much pressure and with repeated uh, attempt, events happening and this critically needed yeah. project, uh, where are we going to get the help? I mean, it's got to happen. We're ready. Not having the help is not a great answer. Can I, uh, may I just ask one more question? So um, does anybody want to flag a concern about being able to bring forward a staffing plan um, with the request for the release of funds? I don't think there's a concern. I think it's a matter of just making sure that it's in the right people's hands um, as we're at the final stretch here.
I am just looking forward to getting it. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Mr. I have faith. <laughs> I think that what you just spent the last hour hearing from Commissioner Manoli, I think that you're going to find similar experiences with this project that is the same approach that we're taking, um, the same hands-on, on-site dedication. Um, so there's a lot of similarities in how the project is structured that we will be able to reap those benefits with UI. And those lessons learned have already been applied. Okay. Uh, can you uh, point to a few uh, like expected dates, timeline, um, what we should expect uh, between now and the beginning of session or uh, between now and the end of session? Um, so contract negotiations wise, um, I think we're, we're coming to a final term on that this week. Um, the last iteration I've seen, there's been there's been information provided to me that makes me feel like we're ready to have a final site contract um, to put forward. And then the questions that are pending, I think we answered 98% of the questions for, uh, requested by JFO, and that should be done this week. And it's going to take some time to do a review, and then we are going to go back to the IR and ensure that the um, asks that I had are addressed in that as well. Okay. So that was so you would see in the IR that was published. Right. <clears throat> yeah, just to uh, kind of build off of uh, the chair's question, are there any dates or months that you would be able to put uh, to any of that? My expectation is that we're going to be having kickoff by the end of January. And Deputy Commissioner, if you have a different date, or Cameron, if you have a different date in mind, that was the expectation that was set by the project team to me. I'm, I would just echo the secretary. I mean, and, and even from a, a staffing perspective, you know, I think our team is, is ready to go. I think internally, uh, you know, I obviously don't speak for ADS as a secretary, but I get that feeling from their side of the house. And uh, from our side on BDAL, you know, we've identified the team members that we know are moving over. So, um, you know, I, I have no reason to think that any, any date different. And, and I can say that we are ready to go whenever that occurs. And how, how long do you expect it will take once um, once you have kickoff? Is the timeline of the project is yeah. it's 24 months. Okay, thank you. Um, and so I, I, I think what I heard was that um, JFO will have what they need uh, by the end of next week. By the end of this week. The end of this so week. Hope. And, okay. and, and I, I probably will have follow-ups. Yes. But. Um, the, what's the rough timeline for JFO analysis? Um, um, normally once? it's a, a couple weeks because we have internal reviews too. Okay. So I have to, I, I've started what I could on the, on the review. And then I want to give the state an opportunity to uh, chime in on the, the report and, and, and then it has to undergo a JFO review. Okay. Um, so that might be ready by the end of, uh, so by the beginning of session? Yeah. Okay. Uh, <coughs> coming up on some holidays. I know. Um, and at that point, would you expect uh, the ask to be for the release of funds? For, uh, yep, and the schedule January. of those deliverables will be outlined in the scope of work that is on the table. Okay. So we'll know where the where where and when on the timeline that those requests for funds and how much that should be outlined. Um, uh, aside from uh, avoiding another flood, um, it, it, for future projects like this, uh, what can we do to help uh, hit our target dates a little bit more effectively? I don't think that there was anything that we could have done. If it wasn't for the flood, I think we would have already kicked off. We would be ready to go. We would be in, in progress on the project right now. Okay. And uh, last one, do you have any, uh, is there any cost um, adjustments over runs or anything as a result of uh, the time, sh the schedule shift? Yes. Okay. Any other questions, comments, concerns, points of interest? All right. Um, 
So uh, we're actually ahead of time here, uh, which is always appreciated. Um, Secretary, would you like to go directly into ERP or wait on anybody? Yeah, we have a representative from AOI joining us. Um, then, uh, like uh, previously, uh, oh, thank you, Cameron and uh, Dustin. I appreciate your attendance. Um, like thank last you. time, Lisa, if you'd like to come up and do a, a quick snapshot. Thanks. Yes. Okay. The ERP project, um, it actually, in my opinion, you can't look at the finance management module, which is the funding that we're really this committee is charged with releasing without looking at the other piece of the project, which is the HR and budget portion. Um, the HR and budget uh, portions were funded in the FY22 big bill, and that was to replace the state um, PeopleSoft uh, human resource system and the budget system, which I'm not even sure what the vendor is, if it was a homegrown system or a CGI. Oh, it's CGI. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, so that's another, it's a very old system. Um, so that was the 12.75 million that was funded back, allocated back in FY22. Um, the financial management module, which would replace uh, the state vision system and also the um, STARS system from AOT, which is a leg legacy finance system that vision couldn't meet the needs of as well as the FARS system. Don't ask me what these acronyms mean, I don't know. The FARS financial system from the Department of Labor, which is another legacy financial system, not that by, by vision. So, um, so that was the $11.8 million uh, for those components. The reason I call out something like those legacy systems is I expect those could be a difficulty or a challenge um, to manage this reason they weren't included in vision in the first place. Um, but as, um, from what I understand, um, it's been confirmed that they could be moved into the new system, but I don't, I don't know for sure, but that was the, the premise. Um, so the cost of the, the, e, the replacement of the ER system includes the uh, licensing for the software and the state had selected um, the Workday vendor, which is an ERP system, which is an enterprise, enterprise resource planning system. Um, it, it's the licensing for that, the ongoing cost, subscription costs for that, the implementation of it. So you need to have a contract with an implementation vendor. Um, and then there's some additional business costs. Um, there was an RFP out by the um, Agency of Administration for business process reengineering work. I don't think that was awarded, um, but it, it was issued. And it's the same situation that you've heard from the DMV and that you, uh, we would, can anticipate for UI. Um, you don't want to uh, pave the old cow paths, right? You want to um, do a complete business process reengineering and take advantage of the capabilities of the new system. So that's the project itself. Um, I spoke of the financing. In the last meeting, I spoke of additional funds that we had identified as being allocated in FY16 and FY18. And that was a total of $10.8 million. And that money has been um, spent and it was originally allocated for ERP phase one and ERP phase two and 18. And we did confirm that the money was spent and it was spent on vision upgrades and for the project VT buys, which was appropriate and allowable um, in the language, we did confirm that. So I wanted to follow up on that piece. Um, so um, the finance system, when it was funded, the financial management piece, the $11.8 million in FY23, that was included the caveats that um, once the um, additional documentation was compiled, um, the state would come back to JITOC after a JFO IT review and, and seek the release of those funds. So the, the, the initial funds, the 12.75 million for the HRM budget, that, has, that was released at the time it was allocated. So, um, so really where the system is at this point is the initial licenses which were purchased um, 
for, and this is a, a public document, for 80, um, 8,325 full-time equivalency employees for the state um, at a cost of $770,000. And that purchase was made in May of 22. I know the at the time, the plan was to go up to bid with the RFP for the HR piece, if not the budget and HR piece in that summer, but then it was determined that there might be some requirements around the financial piece that it'd be better to go forward with the financial piece first. So that original RFP was pulled. Um, so in the meantime, I think because the decision was made to purchase those workday licenses, they proceeded, ADS released an RFP for the implementation of the HR and for all three components of the Workday system. And so I believe that is at the point where a vendor hasn't been identified, but ADS will be going through um, a extensive independent review that will include the consideration of Workday itself. It will include the consideration and the, the RFP of the implementation vendor. And I'm not sure if it's going to include the business process management piece or anything like that, you know, the business costs associated with that. So um, I don't I don't believe that I and, and the state can speak to this, but I don't believe that RFP for the independent review has been released. But once it is released, that that comprehensive independent review will be the one that will inform the review that I will do. So that's the background of the piece. Does anybody have any questions? Um, I was just, so um, when you were saying the last piece on the, the, you're not sure if the business costs would be included in that last, is that something we can request? No. Well, oh, okay. I haven't, I haven't spoken specifically okay. about this, okay. um, about whether the business <laughs> process management piece would be included in that. Okay. 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 Um, and again, this kind of aligns with the, the discussion of what costs should be included as part of the costs. And if, you know, the request is that we think that, you know, the business cost should be included as part of the cost of the project. Um, I imagine that would be included in, in some, some manner, whatever way is appropriate for a vendor that can assess all of that information. Any other questions about this? Not seeing any. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. <laughs> sure. Um, why don't I start by introducing myself? I probably am a very familiar face to some of you, but today I'm here in a different role. So my name is Sarah Clark, and I am the about five weeks in uh, new deputy secretary of the Agency of Administration. I am also the executive sponsor from the business side for the ERP project. So very um, excited for that and happy to be here. You may recognize me um, from about a month ago, I worked at the Joint Fiscal Office as the deputy there. Uh, and I think it's relevant to our discussion today. Prior to working for the Joint Fiscal Office, I was in state government for about 18 years. I've worked in many different departments and agencies and always in a financial capacity. So I say that because I think it's important to understand that I have used our accounting system both from a high level as the chief financial officer for the Agency of Human Services but also as a more, let's say, detail-oriented business manager for the Department of Forest Parks and Recreation. Um, like all state employees, I rely on the system for uh, my timesheet and payroll, but I've also had some experience using VTHR from a management perspective. I think this information is relevant because I am um, a user of the system, not a super user, but probably I have been at times in my career but I think it's a really important perspective to bring to this conversation as we work to implement a new ERP. I understand that the backbone of our state government and effective operations is an effective accounting and HR system and a budgeting system, I should say that as well. And so I understand the importance of this project as we move forward. So from the last time we met, what has transpired um, are continued um, contract negotiations 
<clears throat> but we also, um, outside of the open RFP that we have right now, I invited Workday to come to Vermont. This was the first time I had had a chance to engage with their team and gave them a chance to meet with our executive steering committee because as the, the business executive sponsor, I am the IT executive sponsor for the project. So we are working hand in hand on this. And we invited all of the um, project leadership to this session. And we had about 30 people in the room. Um, and it was the first chance many folks had had to experience the platform and the, the possibility <coughs> of the platform. And looking at it from a how we operate as a state today, where we have a mobile workforce, we are also in the office. Um, our ERP system is supporting all three branches of government today. And we, it, it gave folks a chance to look at it outside from their day-to-day -day management and their day-to-day -day tasks and look at it from a user impact standpoint. And it was a, a, a well-spent afternoon. Um, subsequently, they scheduled another follow-up with the um, project teams embedded within the agencies as well. So everybody got to look at it from a what about me standpoint, how does it affect me, how does it affect my job outside of AOA and AES. And we had representation from um, many of the agencies. And I think moving forward, knowing that this has an impact on all three branches, we need to look at expanding that to beyond just ADS, AOA and the core sponsorship team that we have. So. <clears throat> That's what's transpired. Um, we are in the works on the IR RFP, so that should be, um, that's moving forward as needed. And from a timing standpoint, I would say we're looking at, my hope is Q1 of next year is what we would be looking at calendar year is what we'd be looking at for uh, timing. For kickoff. Mm -hmm. And how long is this project expected to take? Um, this is a three to four year project in its entirety. And uh, there's a lot because as you would describe, it's, it's kind of the foundational um, system behind government operations for the entire state that we need to be very cognizant of it. Um, there is going to be a change management component that's reviewed in the IR that's built into the current contract, but holistically around business process change and business process optimization um, that is an open, that is a, an open agenda item today. Absolutely. Secretary Riley Hughes, so three to four years, um, maybe none of the people in this room will be here. So can you um, kind of walk us through um, how ADS ensures kind of consistency over time? Like what are the backstops for the, you know, variables uh, in terms of humans? When you say humans, you're talking about the fact that all of these people may, none of these people may be here um, in, in three or four years. So how will we anticipate that this project will stay on track? And, you know, like, what are the safeguards for keeping things moving? Because as I've said, with other, other IT projects that we've seen, I've seen like multiple project managers. I mean, perhaps we'll have a different administration, perhaps. None of us will run for office. <laughs> Who knows? You know, so there's a lot of unknowns. Yeah, Matt, I would say that the the work that is going into the current contract around the functional requirements and the non-functional requirements, and having that established in the contract itself, with the commitment to those timelines and the outcomes, and also the impact to the current operations and current environment is critical. That's why we want to get the contract right up front. Um, commitment and buy-in with the business uh, users and business leadership is also critical to that success too. And I think from what I've been able to see over the last five months, um, we, are, we are getting to a point of that where I am seeing that take, take place. I am seeing that being written into the contract. We have a dedicated project team to this, not only a project team with an ADS, but with an AOA, and looking to extend that out to the agencies because 
each one of our agencies and departments, we have our own uh, finance office or business office and getting the folks there in integrated, we won't miss anybody in that process, which is why looking at this holistically as a whole of state government, not just an executive branch initiative is going to be critical. Maybe, uh, maybe, okay. So maybe I'll ask this question a little, uh, just maybe a slightly different way. Um, you know, this process is two years down the road mm -hmm. and all of a sudden we have, let's say we do have a different administration and that administration says we hate this, can it? So it, it, I'm wondering how this project kind of maintains a stable trajectory when it's, you know, in, over, over that length of time. Dude, it's hard to keep an eye on something over that length of time. Mm -hmm. And so I'm looking for some reassurances. And, and this may be a question you want to, I don't know, if you, have, if, if you haven't thought about this, maybe, maybe to think about just for Vermonters, like how do we say that over time, these investments, um, you can feel good that we're going to get there. Definitely something that we're talking about. We've spent um, many meetings, the two of us, on not only the why, but on the how. Um, when I say four years, I am including the decommissioning of all of the current systems. And so prior to coming here today, I had a meeting with my team around impact analysis. We looked at all the IT mod projects, but we looked at all of the major modernization projects going on right now. When did they start? How long are they going holistically? And they have data integration points and data dependency points across all of them. So if I look at ERP alone, that affects the BT BIOS project, that affects the UI project, that affects the um, uh, DMV project. So there is a touch point along the way, and we have to make sure that we map that out up front, which is what we've done and what we continue to do, but also make sure that that's not information that sits just within the executive sponsor team or sits just within ADS or AOA, that it's something that we're all working towards as that goal. I don't wanna see it be four years to go live, I would like to see it be two years to go live. Um, but I also have to be realistic too that we've got fiscal years and budget planning and we've got activity that is going to slow it down. Um, so could I expect three years to be that go live? Three years does seem a long way away right now, but there are going to be certain touch points like the DMB project. That first phase, they're celebrating it as a go live, but really it's a quick win because it's the first phase. There's more to come and that was a year. So we'll, we'll be able to see some of those activities go online. Now, as far as somebody coming in and ripping and replacing, bad move. You know, that's always the worst thing that happens in a change of administration is somebody goes and makes a big decision like that that affects the entire operations of state government. So I would hope that that wouldn't happen just from a pure sure. ethics standpoint. But um, I think three years with incremental go lives across the board is going to be Critical. Also, committed buy-in that stays and that is resurfaced, the why and the, um, the people side, we need to make sure that that stays communicated at, at, across the board every time this, this comes. This is not a technical modernization project. The technology is just the fuel to get there. This is actually a major people business process change that's taking place, and it's for the better. And if I may, I mean, I've been here five weeks. I think I'm two days into my sixth week. So I have a lot that I'm coming up to speed on. But as I said, I have some experience in our current systems. I think it's really important as we develop the project and the resource plan um, that we continue to work with our partners across state government, because this is a statewide implementation, uh, meaning across all parts of state government, multiple users. And so it's not just from an executive sponsor leadership that could potentially change um, with the change of administration, but it's making sure that the goals and the outcomes we're trying to achieve with this project comes from, from the ground up, if you, know, if you understand what I'm saying, so that the users of the system are able to communicate to us what they're hoping to see for business process transformation, and that we build a system that lets us modernize and meets the needs of a more modern workforce. For an example, and I learned this at the Workday demo, where I was able to download an app on my phone. It was, you know, a test app, but it's an app on my phone. If you've ever tried to do your timesheet on your cell phone now, you understand how that can be challenging. 
So there was an app on the phone that we downloaded and I could kind of quickly, like just how I know how to use apps now, I'm not a super IT person, but know how to use an app, Amazon, et cetera. But how I could kind of quickly navigate to doing a timesheet, or I think the example we used was as a manager looking at one of my employees' timesheets. Um, and I use that as an example of modernizing the ERP that the state of Vermont uses um, as the backbone for its operations. And something as kind of as seemingly simple as that for our from our everyday lives, but will be kind of a monumental shift um, in our systems and is a goal of mine personally, and I, I probably for many state employees and maybe yourselves included in terms of how you actually do your timesheets. Um, so. And to that uh, very quick, there's kind of a uh, saying in user experience design that um, there is a proper web design takes place of every app. So if you design your website correctly, you don't need an app. Um, and then you don't need to worry about any of the associated permissions, things that people go through uh, having something installed on their phone. Um, is the current web experience with uh, this provider, um, shall we say, uh, not to the point where people can avoid the app if they want to use their phone? Uh, like if they're using the web, they have to be on a PC in order for it to really work? So the, I'll answer that. They're mobile first um, organization. And from the consideration of what an app would be, we would be able to have our own Vermont login is what it comes down to rather than, and it's easy to get that at a store rather than open a browser on a mobile device. So they could get the same experience on a browser on a mobile device, but from a security standpoint, um, having an app available on a tablet or, or a phone is a, a much more secure experience for the user. So that's why we would want to go with app. Looking at it from a web portal view, from a, from a desktop machine, it will be a web portal view, regardless of what the modern platform is that we would choose. That is, that is customary for today's modern ERP systems. Um, but we, won't, we don't want to limit it to that because many times that web portal view is for a rich client machine, not for a mobile device. And so travel, uh, expense reporting, um, timesheet approvals, not just logging your timesheet, but being able to do timesheet approvals on the fly, budgeting, finance planning, finance validation, all of those things are critical in a single central environment, a single central ERP environment. And so we have the opportunity to do that now. Um, having been through budget planning for the first time at the state over the last few months. Um, I am amazed at the number of spreadsheets that exist out there. I would like to see that embedded in a single system rather than 15 or 20. Um, that is that cost avoidance that I think that we will see over time is, is decommissioning all of those legacy systems. But being able to have that one single central ERP system that does everything the state needs it to do from budget planning to finance management to ERP, cap, you know, human capital management, that's going to be really critical for us moving forward. Okay. Um, when you're done. I've got uh, two other questions, but um, I, I can circle back. So uh, integrated eligibility, is that project complete? Is the project complete for in integrated eligibility? Mm -hmm. Do you know what I'm talking about? Are we we're switching gears? AHS, yes. I'm sorry. Uh, so I'm trying to explain my frame, my my concern around the timing. So the AHS program. Uh, yes. Is it complete? No, ma'am. It's it's an ongoing program. It's a what? Ongoing. It's ongoing. Yeah. So that is when I think of my question to you around timing. Mm -hmm. I have that in my head, very specifically, um, mm -hmm. as a project that. I, so, the, I mean, the legislature has a, you know, we have an oversight role. Mm -hmm. The administration, obviously, you know, you are the experts in putting this in. And so I don't feel like, even though we took so much testimony, Senator, were, were you here? Were you on the committee then, Mr. Chair? Uh -huh. uh, yes, I think you were, maybe. Yeah. So much testimony on that. And I could not tell you where we are right now on that project. Um, and that was years ago. That was pre-COVID for sure. Um, and so that's the nature of my question around the three to four. It's like, how do we keep, how? Mm -hmm. So 
I appreciate the work that the administration has done in establishing the agency of digital services, the improvement in systems. Um, you know, we have this committee. We've got you know our uh, folks in JFO. But how do we not have that happen uh, anytime we have a project that takes time? So this, I don't want to say it's apples and oranges. Um, this is a, the ERP project is a self-funded project. It is a state-funded project, not federal. So that makes a big difference too. Is that we are we are coming here and making sure that internally within the state that we have all of our checks and balances in place. The IUNE project had many different or has many different you know federal, state, agency based with AHS, and you could probably speak more to that one than I could. Um, this is we are bringing the groundswell of our needed champions up front, not by force, but by commitment and by intended outcomes with this project. I am seeing that we are approaching this much differently. And I think I said this last time too, I think that the state made a good decision in the platform that they did choose. And this is also a platform that components of it are already being used in the state today and they're working very well. So like any major modernization project, this is going to be change for folks, um, but we have to put a cap in it. It will end here. This is not gonna be a long drawn out project. And ensuring that we've got the leadership teams across the agencies in commitment as well is a critical piece. You know, the human behavior side is going to be our biggest resistance point to change. Um, and I think that we're well on our way there to to the right direction in getting it done. Long, I, think, I think I've explained my point. You have. <laughs> that. Long projects often end up costing more than uh, short projects, even if it's the same project. Um, what can be done to compress this project to make it um, perhaps more efficient, uh, get uh, processes working in parallel instead of sequential? Um, to maybe allow it to go a lot sooner, uh, you know, in the two to three year range instead of three to four. In our last executive steering committee meeting, we had just that same conversation. And so given that we're in contract negotiations on the implementation right now, that's in discussions. Um, I would love to go live tomorrow. <laughs> you know, the reality is that's, that's what we want to hear. Yeah. <laughs> You have. Oh, I, just, I just was wondering about the timeline for the independent review piece because that would come back to us first, right? Yes. So I was just curious. So if you're going to start in Q1 on the project, what is? Are we? I anticipate that we're probably going to be starting in the March timeframe, and that you should have the independent review in January. Okay. Thanks. Um, what uh, as you're you're going through this, what? Um, what CalPads have you um, noticed that need to be changed uh, most drastically? Or, I, I mean, the, the, the processes that are currently in place, a lot of them are very legacy. Um, as, uh, we talked about the DMV project changing things as needed. Have you gotten to a point where you can say, um, here's a couple of opportunities for the way we currently do things that really need to change? I mean, I, I think I can give a few examples, but keep in mind, I'm new in this position, but like I can share from my own kind of personal experience, um, some things that I, I'd love to see modernize. Um, so for example, as a manager of, of people, um, and maybe not me specifically, but others like managing a staff through um, both the pandemic and through a flood where you have teams that are working crazy hours in response to disasters of one sort and another, for a manager to be able to quickly run um, a report or have a dashboard in a system that could tell you how much overtime your team is working, how much leave balances that they have so that you can kind of more seamlessly manage the workload that your team is facing. 
um, I use that as an example. So I don't know if that's answer you're asking for cow patties, um, but I've cow pass. Sorry, <laughs> <laughs> see how I twisted that. Um, but as hopefully they don't turn into <laughs> of an enhancement that I think would be useful, kind of across state government, um, being more um, effective at managing our limited resources, because I think that's a common theme that we've yes. certainly in the legislature and in the executive branch we've heard a lot about in the last two to three years, probably over time, but we really have seen that dramatic impact in the last two to three years through the pandemic and now the flood. So I think that's an example. The secretary referenced um, financial reports. So this is from my experience of the Agency of Human Services, having a kind of budget to actuals report that could be generated from a system automatically, as opposed to spreadsheets um, that are happening across state government, where your financial staff are really doing a great job monitoring the expenditures of the state, but it is a manual process. And so a goal of the system would be to minimize manual processes like that and try to set up automations so that we can produce some of these financial monitoring reports, if you will, um, so staff can maybe focus their time on analysis as opposed to developing other reports and make it more seamless for managers to be able to have access to that information. That would be a goal that I would have for this system. Um, One of the first meetings that I had had in the executive steering committee was reviewing a list of expectations on what this system should and could be doing. And given that it creates change, um, there's a lot of things that we're um, not openly talking about within our business operations teams and our staff and our, and our managers to say this is what it's supposed to do. And one example of that is um, grant management. This comes up consistently from the public side they want to know what grants they have available to them. But from the internal finance management side, being able to track the, um, the accounting of grants within the state system is critical of an ERP system that is not built into our current system today. So that's a, that could be a cow patty if we don't uncover it and, or pat, 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 <laughs> pat, cow pat, <laughs> cow pat. Pat? Pat. Pat. Yeah. I guess it depends um, if it's working. <laughs> so, but talking about it and being having the right expectations on what this should do puts everybody on the same page because we have a lot of disparate systems right now that are front end systems, back end systems, and this should be the one back end system that should be doing it all. We shouldn't have multiple systems that do that. We should be able to say this is the back end system. So if you are delivering a front end grant, to Vermonters, to municipalities, to the public, to users, to people, that at least we can manage it effectively so we don't go under or over, and there's always that point in time. That's the expectation of an ERP system. That's one example. So making sure that that path is um, identified, communicated, evangelized, and out there is gonna be really, really important. Uh, do you anticipate any changes to the chart of accounts or things that are so structural that it could impact other systems and require changes in other systems throughout state government? I love that you asked that question because that is the question that's been coming from the business offices. And um, they are influencing that determination because they are the users of that and the creators of that. So. Um, I know Mr. Combs, our CTO, has been involved in some of those conversations, but other than what I shared just now, um, I think we're looking to maintain consistency there, but also um, ensure the automation piece. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think in terms of compass, that is <laughs> definitely one of the wider ones that's trotted today that we would love to not you know, build upon. Um, so the reason we have so many of those multitude of systems is because they couldn't organize their chart of accounts to provide reporting to one another, to provide effective you know, uh, distribution management and disbursement management to one another. So I think it's that chart of accounts that's key. I really look at this as the greatest opportunity for us to ensure financial transparency, budget transparency, and you know, I would say faster operations because of the, the potential. So those are high expectations, I do understand, but it, it's what it's capable of doing 
now the people side of it is going to, you know, be a factor too. Um, to the to this project and kind of to a broader scope, um, one of the challenges we have is a lot of the processes and systems that um, we use in state are somewhat labor intensive. Um, what are some of the key uh, labor saving uh, steps? You, like I, we, we talked about the kind of single pane of glass for both the user and the, the, um, the, the manager. Um, do we have any expectations of like how much can you quantify how much uh, labor savings we'll be able to make, like how much of each person's day will be uh, saved <laughs> by not having to um, go through some of these antiquated systems and processes? So I'm going to answer, but I've been here for five weeks. So I'm going to keep stressing that so <laughs> Denise will kick me if she needs to. Um, to my knowledge, I don't believe that we've quantified what could be hours of labor savings from implementing um, this new system, this new ERP. I think one of my goals would, would maybe not be a number of hours reduced from, it would, be, it would be more where an employee would be able to use some time that could be freed up to do more high value analysis, for example. Um, that that would be, it wouldn't be like an overall reduction in need of resources, but um, a better use of the resources that we have, that would be a goal that I would have. So I hope that she's nodding, so that's, that's good. Yes. And hopefully improve quality of life. Of exactly. And I do think, you know, um, I've had some great conversations in my first few weeks, but trying to establish some benchmarks for where we are now with our system, for example, on perhaps like the number of manual processes that we have now, or the number of customizations that we have now, and trying with a goal of getting that maybe to zero or as close to zero as possible as what makes the most sense for a new system and trying to track that. If I may, so I, I think Unlike the, the DMV system, which was 50 years old, and you instantly saw days, 45 days worth of process improvement in many cases, um, this is a modernization, but it's also the end of life of a product set, so we're moving to another. And I think what we get on a new product set is the ability to adopt many new features and functions more rapidly and easily down the road that will give us savings. Um, we do have some anecdotal stories from other states who have you know, adopted this platform. Um, in one instance, their employee onboarding experience essentially is all automated and driven off of you enter in the information from their their I nine or their W two rep, excuse me, which is it W two, and that kicks <laughs> off everything automated to the point that, that you know within minutes their their laptop image is already being you know built for them, so that, that you know by the time they leave that office they'll they'll be able to take a laptop. Those are the types of automations of things that we cannot do today on our current platform. And actually that raises another question. Uh, the, the existing system, um, at what point in this process are we going to be able to uh, stop paying for that? <laughs> when we go live. At the, the final, at the end of the three years? Yeah. So we're tracking that right now because um, contract renewal dates will fall in the middle of um, the implementation process. And so we need to um, plan ahead on that one so that we're not just extending if it is not in the best interest of the state or risk renewing and renewing at a higher rate because we are paying for two systems right now and that is not um, the position that I want to be in with the state. Do we have the ability to uh Lock in a, a, a fixed cost so we know what it'll be for the next three years, or is it uh, we've got to renew every six months at whatever the market? No, we have a is. we have a multi-year um, continuation on a current contract, and um, there's just a little bit of gap between uh, what the current projected implementation date is and that. So when I when when we get closer to the point where we have an artifact of the contract. I'll be able to give more solid response. And that's good. I'm sorry? We have a 10-year term for this. No, 
No, I was talking about yeah. the current right. system. Yeah. Oh, sorry. But we're also now looking at tracking all of the disparate ones as well. So I know I had said 14. Um, we're looking at that, um, that as well as, as a, a, a contract management, cost management um, burn down when it comes to the um, kind of our TCO of the current system and also the cost savings that we'll see once we go live. Is that noted in the, the total cost of the project? I'm unsure it is in the current draft of the ITABC, but that's not been released yet. It'll be released at, at the IR. And I know there was some uh, question about the, the, the new system uh, subscription already starting to take. Uh, mm -hmm. Can you uh, speak to that at all of any updates? Uh, like, uh, we were we are factory. currently paying for that in a um, an agreement that was established in 2022, I believe. And so um, we are looking to see what our options are to um, modify any of those current costs if we're not able to use the system today. Okay. Uh, at what point in the, 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 will we not be able to use the new system um, until go live in three years or is it? We'll see some, we use it with like DMP, we'll see some, some phase, phase go lives. Okay. Um, is that the full, like, is it different suites or different packages within, or it's kind of an all or nothing? Yeah, same, same as what we have today for the current ERP system, although we're on different versions depending on who you talk to, it's still one suite, one encompass tool. Okay. Or should what's yawning? <laughs> <laughs> no, talking about tech for three hours is, is it is very exciting, but it can be tiring. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. Are there any other questions, comments, concerns, points of interest? So we're waiting to hear back on the results of the RFP and the independent review and Lisa's independent review of the independent review. <laughs> yes. Okay. Great. Cool. Please. Not on this project, but can we ask questions on other projects? I would like to do that. Um, so I, I think. Just ask the secretary to sit in the hot seat. So, uh, CF story. Um, yes. Yeah. Can you talk to us about the system and timelines? And um, I don't know if Lisa is uh, on the DCF system, um, if you have anything to add on that. So the timing was excellent because I think that if it had been released in a couple of weeks, I wouldn't be able to talk about it. We have an RFP that is going live this month um, which is that system. So uh, that is, it's been in the works. That is not um, an IT mod fund project, but it is an ADS supported project through AHS and through DCF. And um, that system is not Part of access, it is a, its own independent system, and it is time to replace it. Uh, and the funding for that project is—is is it state? Or? It's a 60-40 split, from my understanding. There is 60% federal, there's 40% um, state funding, and that is part of the DCF um, budget. That is not an EDS uh, fund that we manage. Can you say that again? Please? It's not an EDS fund that we're managing. So I'm not sure which committee it's coming out of, but it is not um, ours. Um, I just want to clarify. So is this one of the projects that is available through the dashboard because of the funding? Will this be one of those? Because it, um, the dashboard currently that the um, Enterprise Project Management Office has is direct allocation projects. And there are some projects that aren't viewable through that because they're not direct allocation. And would this be one of them? 
I don't believe. Yeah, I, I'm not sure of the answer, but it sounds like it may not be part of that. Um, but that doesn't mean so we are in the process actually of replacing um, or creating a new project management system. So we will have some visibility into all of the projects that we have going on, which we would love to ensure is public. <coughs> Perfect. Mm -hmm. That would be great. Is there a timeline for that? Our project, our project management tool. Um, we're going live in, but yeah, in the next month. Okay. So with regard to the funding for this project, mm -hmm. so can you just explain the difference between, um, so why is this not an ADS managed? It is ADS managed. We are just not, it's not a, um, it's not a fund that we are managing. It is an, so why would that happen for an IT project? So what's I'm the difference? I'm assumption because I don't know the full fact, but likely because it's a 60-40 split of federal funds and there are requirements federally that need to be um, managed to that would be on the, um, on the plate of AHS. Are there other IT projects like that that are not, that where the funding is not under control of ADS? Um, I mean, there is, yes. When you say control, so that is... Well, I'm yeah. interpreting what I'm hearing. There so. are no IT projects in the state that don't have some ADS review or oversight in some way. Um, there are some, especially ones that have heavy federal funding associated with them, that we are not the right funding managed party for it. It would need to be through AHS or through whatever whoever the agency is that is... Uh, managing that federal uh, requirement, but our team is the one doing the work. Our team is the one uh, project managing. Our IT staff is the one that's engaged. And is there a project lead at AHS uh, or DCF, wherever yes. it is? Yes. Okay. And has that project um, uh, flown through the legislature in any of the policy committees? Has anyone seen that? My understanding is it has. It was before my time, though. Okay. So this is, so. <laughs> so it still goes through the same mechanisms. It still goes through the IR. It still yep. has to be the ITABC. We still have all of our internal processes and, and um policies that are required to be followed. Yeah. And so the, this has gone through all of that as well. So <clears throat> I just don't have some of the answers off the top of my head because I know that we have about 125 projects right now. Okay, that's good to know. Um, this, but this is kind of going back to my earlier point of, um, you know, I, mean, I, I we really have to continue to evolve the, um, not only the implementation and um, of these projects, but also our oversight of these projects. Like if we, if we, you know, if we don't know if this has even been, where this has even been um, in the legislature, that's, who would, who would know? I that? don't know. Who would know? Well, AHS would know that. I know I have staff yeah. who do know that, and I, I wasn't prepared to answer that. I'm going to calm down because AHS would probably have more answers. And I will tell you, I mean, there, I did just announce, um, Governor Scott announced the deputy for the Agency of Digital Services, who is the current commissioner for um, DEVA. And having somebody who has been embedded so tightly, both on the public facing service side the most vulnerable Vermonter, that user experience piece that I was telling you about the last time, that's going to be critically important to EDS's growth and development and maturity as an agency. So having um, Andrea on board is critical to this. So absolutely have a pulse on what you're asking for, and it is something that EDS is committed to transparency of and management of when it comes to tech. Uh, so, Mr. Chair, the you know obviously that story was appalling, horrifying actually is the word, um, and we you know are not going to be able to really affect what's happening with those kids, um, but I think we do have an obligation to make sure we have a sense of what's going on with that system, um, and so I would ask 
that um, you consider making this a priority for our next meeting to hear about the system and getting this kind of a full status of what the workarounds are. Well, that may not, that may be a policy area, but the IT sure. aspect of that. Thank you. And also, uh, Secretary, uh, what other um, systems, uh, I know you probably don't know off the top of your head, but uh, a topic for the discussion is what other systems are uh, currently in a similar condition that um, you perhaps haven't been getting uh, attention and really need to. Um, do you have any? Do you mind if I, if I phrase your question in a way that I can answer? Sure, please. Um, are there other systems in a very current, a similar state that are being run across state government? Yes, there are. Um, are we aware of them? 100% aware of them. And ensuring that we have the priority around replacing it um, shared, vocalized, um, identified. I mean, you're talking about impact to children, impact to the world, their well being. You know, we talk humanizing the whole aspect of it. These are affecting Vermonters every day. So, um, yes, we have a pulse on that. Um, there, as we start modernizing some of these systems, there's a major initiative going on at AHS right now around both data modernization, data warehousing. IE is also um, on track with them, and you will see that EDS is going to have a tighter engagement to that. I would say, let's call it on the back end, similar to what we are doing in the housing space around data and data access to housing availability and um, the efforts that our partners in state government are focused on ACCD. And we are, we are trying to be the fuel engine for them to ensure these, are, these, these things are met. And when we have systems that have a criticality to um, children and children's well-being, we will absolutely see that as not only my priority, but my, my peers' priority in the agency or department that is leading that, init that service initiative. Do you have uh, an idea of uh, roughly what percentage of those systems have <coughs> an impact to health and well being of Vermonters um, and what systems might be for, I don't know, cataloging paint colors of state buildings or something like that? I don't think I could give you a percentage necessarily, but we're actually going through an exercise right now um, on similar to there was a there are lists around vulnerable systems provided, looking at it from all layers. There's a security consideration that needs to be um, uh, looked at. There is, a, is it end of life, which, I mean, the system we were just talking about, if it's end of life, that puts a whole other set of risks around not being able to develop, access, connectivity, you know, it starts driving the real processes, but also has a security risk to it. And security risks also become um, potential data privacy um, exposures as well. So there is the, the health piece, which I could say, you know, maybe they exist with an AHS, maybe they're an AOE, maybe they're here, maybe they're there. There are, there are absolutely public facing systems or public impact systems that are out there that we are looking to replace, but looking at it from a expired, out of support, out of date, and, and security vulnerability, that's critical too. And now as you're hearing, starting this session, you're hearing a lot about business process optimization and change. And so ensuring that we're building systems that are designed to meet the needs of the users that the service is intended for is a whole different approach than we were taking 20, 30, 40 years ago on systems that were about turning on, turning on a tech system. And so you're seeing this evolution take place right now. Two more, and then I'll turn. Uh, you had a question also, right? Um, the uh, connectivity to other systems, uh, do these uh, ancient uh, antique systems uh, have a lot of connectivity that presents uh, security risk um, to allow a, a path in? Um, the, yeah, obviously, no details, but. Um, um, I would say any system that is running unsupported technology creates an exposure risk. And so reducing the footprint, reducing the connectivity and access 
is something that the team has been working on for quite some time. Okay. Uh, right down to removing it from the network. I would hear that. Mm -hmm. um, and lastly, the um, timeline and process for updating these systems. Um, are we looking at a 10 year plan, a five year plan? What, what's the expectation for um, not having any more of uh, these headlines pop up about, hey, this ancient thing? So you're describing something that is not unique to Vermont. It is very common in public sector in general. And um, sometimes we are at the mercy of funding. Sometimes we're also at the mercy of competing initiatives too. And so policy and initiative sometimes can trump the actual need. And um, if I could make, wave my magic wand, what I'd say, eight years. And then another administration comes in or another you know, committee comes in and you have different people making different decisions that does change that. Um, we absolutely have a roadmap. Uh, we actually have a five-year IT plan that we manage for and so that is tracking some of these systems as well and um, based on what we can ensure budget for the cost of the um, the system itself that all that all factors in and like I said it's not unique to Vermont by any means um, so I could sit here and testify and give you a date and the reality is tomorrow that could change uh maybe when we get into session we can review some of those more for our education so that we understand more of what's going on with these things oh, yeah your last answer kind of changed my question so i don't know if it's for <laughs> either of you um i was just wondering so when you talk about the you know, the new project management software and then you talk about like the now you just talked about like the roadmaps and things like that i was just curious like how do we review kind of broadly the projects like i'm i don't on the project management track, will that show things that are only being like having current funding or will that include everything that you're looking at for your roadmaps? Like, I just don't know how we do better at like long time, long term oversight, I guess. Like, you're talking about the app website? Uh, just in general, like the, the projects. So I, you have the project management tool that you're talking about, like implementing soon. Um, but then you also talked about like the roadmaps. But and just like broadly, how do how do we better understand all of the projects that you're that are at risk and not at risk, and kind of how they fit in? Is like if we can be better stewards of like reaching our committees and being like, you need to expect to increase funding here because it's going to impact all this other stuff that we're. I guess one thing that I'm just thinking of coming from these committee meetings and watching all these things and like reaching out to other committees, being like, do you know this project is like? There's, I'm just really curious about the communication between ADS and us and then other committees and like how we just do better at like all managing this stuff and knowing uh I guess the transparency piece that's, that's a lot and I don't know if there's, there's a question there but I just like don't it seems I, bizarre I, I, <laughs> I'm like okay. I'm with you and I I own the obligation to that along with all the other leaders in state government too uh, we could be doing a better job communicating. We could be doing a better job surfacing that from the technology standpoint. That is part of the organizational maturity plan that I have already kickstarted. And so it's going to take time, um, but it absolutely should be transparent and it should be known. It should be aware so that we our understanding. I, I would say right now, from the experience that I've had thus far, there's a lot of conversations going around, but, but there's not a lot of documentation um, of that. You know, as far as when we're planning for things, we, we've talked about data privacy and data and where does that exist. And the um, um, Pasara had done a data inventory report that I just found out about. And so looking at how do we make those type of communications more available so that people know that it's there and we're not reinventing the wheel every time. And um, I don't want to boil the ocean by any means, but when it comes to key technology projects, um, starting with what we're doing and replacing the project management actions and replacing, we didn't have one, creating a project management tool that is going to look at resource availability, it's going to look at um, 
project budgeting, it's going to look at timelines, it's going to look at impact, it, there's a whole host of things that um, we're going to look to enhance what we're doing today. Just as like a follow, like, um, so that's awesome. Um, <laughs> I guess like if you, like how can we do better, like was that something that you plan to just bring here and then we talk through like how we can support that or like how can we do better as a committee helping to hold like that accountable? <laughs> like I think um, so far looking at some of these major modernization projects that I, we've come forward every month and okay. talked about, yeah. it's really important. Okay. Um, I have felt nothing but partnership from JFO this isn't a force. Nobody is telling us what to do. This is a partnership, and I'm feeling the same thing here. Um, I I want to have an answer for you, right? No, it's and I, uh, I just, this, yeah. I, <laughs> let me give that some thought because I'm still also trying to navigate um, how this all operates. Yeah. Um, what, but from, from my part, what I'd like to do is for us uh, to take a kind of a proactive role in uh, reviewing this stuff so that we can update the other committees. I don't know if that would be casually or via memo or something like that. Like, hey, we took a closer look at X, Y, and Z. Um, here's some potential risk uh, that your committee might want to take a, a look at. Um, and uh, you know, I, I'm not sure how that timeline will play out, but uh, just kind of a seems like a good practice. To yeah. Get into. Um, the uh, DCF system, the foster. Your system. Uh, is it required? Do are we required to fund that with uh, federal funds? So could we could we pay for that ourselves? I don't know that answer. Okay. Um, so that would be. Do you know, Lisa? I can't imagine relying on federal funds. Yeah, it's a, a requirement. I fund anything you wanted. It just the system's going to be probably more expensive than any of the ones we're seeing today. Um, and the federal money is 60%. And, and, and going back to the earlier question, the, the funding has to go general fund directly to the agency or department. It can't go IT modernization fund because it has to be a clean dollar, they call it. So there's a lot of, <laughs> I, I think, a lot of hoops to jump through. I think there's also a lot of strings attached to like having certain systems. So they fund certain systems, but their requirements, and you would know, would probably be wrapped up in what Medicaid and I think the child welfare system is actually not funded by Medicaid. It's for E, right. and so I I do think it's a really important question that you would be best served by having someone from the agency of human yeah. services to come and talk and talk about their funding formula for that project. Yeah. So that I'm asking that question because I'm trying to understand and and. Uh, I, I recognize the amount of time that you've been sitting in that chair. So yeah. this is not about um, you, Madam Secretary, at all. But, you know, how this project could not have been a priority. Like, how we could have had so many other projects in front of us. Um, and again, we don't have anybody from AHS here. We don't, we're not getting any of that history. But, I mean, can you speak to that at all? I mean, how a project like this would, I mean, In terms of recommendations, uh, you know, not have been higher on the list. I can't speak to that, but I do know that even RFP hitting the streets this month, and this system is targeted for replacement right now, and um, that's that's what my team is focusing on. Do you know um, how many? Systems are currently uh, targeted for replacement and are in the, the phases to put out RFPs that we haven't discussed in this committee yet. That we haven't discussed over the last three sessions? Correct. Um, so we have 125 projects in varying stages of flight right now. Some are active in flight, some are pre flight. Um, so there's a lot. Okay. Um, there are some that um, some that will absolutely go through our um, finance billing models, and some that won't. And I'm not sure. I've really not looked at it from that lens, but I can understand that that would be relevant to do so. Okay. 
And so of those 125 projects, which ones will we hear about and when and why? So we have a list of the IT mod projects, which I think that there are nine on that list. So you will hear about nine from that um, under this committee or any that would be added to the agenda. And the other 116 um, would be potentially um, like upgrading Microsoft 10 to Microsoft 11 or something like that that wouldn't be coming Somewhere, through us? Yeah. Okay. And, who, and so where's legislative oversight for those projects? So um, is, it in the, is it in the individual budgets of the different agencies? Is it in your budget? So where does the legislature have uh, a view into that? Um, you are giving a really great use case as to why we need to move forward quickly with a PRP replacement system. You're welcome. Um, thank you. That's <laughs> um, I don't. I don't have visibility into all of that because of some of some of that. But there are some that do get um, built through ADS. We've got. A, a, Budget model where there's a portion that is allocation, a portion that's demand, and allocation is that planned, known, um, you know, standard operations, and the demand is basically the chargeback SLA that um, or timesheet that we bill back to the agencies as these efforts take place. You know, anything above and beyond, which is the majority. Yes. Please. Um, I too was appalled to read the article this morning from Roger here. Uh, that's only a 41 year old system. And what I've heard today is there are some 50 year old systems we're replacing. So it's really put it in perspective for me. So thank you for helping me understand just how old some of the systems are and why maybe they got replaced or are being replaced first. I'm having to stomach the fact that when we see the 90s, it seemed like yesterday. And that's 30 <laughs> years old. And older. So it's no, I totally understand. So from a human side, I have um, half of my nieces and nephews have been adopted into my family through foster care and they were DCF kids. And my sisters are foster parents. And I know I don't talk about, you know, the personal side, but I, I had that same reaction when I read it and I didn't look at it necessarily. As a, as a system limitation, I looked at it as an opportunity for we have a chance to do better. We have a chance to do better for Vermonters. We have a chance to do better for um, kids in general and foster parents and social workers. And so we have the opportunity now. It is going, it is an active project. It is part of the 125. And we'll make it happen with the right business partners at our side. Again. I, I definitely would love if we could hear from HS on this. Um, at a, on this visit, yeah. yeah and, and that we're careful that we stick to the IT aspect of this. Um, go ahead. I'd like to talk for a moment about risk management and our ability to identify uh, systems that have characteristics of risk as this one does uh, that need attention. Uh, is it possible or is it likely that we have other systems that have similar kinds of issues that we've not yet identified? And do we have methodologies in place to identify things before they blow up, basically? We are working on that right now from a technology perspective. <clears throat> um, I think that there is a blend between technology, because this system is up and running, it's operational, it's functional, um, it doesn't, we don't see outages of this system, but it has the human impact side, which is really tied to the business process and the business, the business um, service needs. And so finding that balance between what we would track with an ADS and what the agency would need to track, um, building some parallels there. Are going to be well, what I'm asking really is, is there a formal system in place to identify the kinds of criteria that cause us to make the judgment that the system needs to be replaced and needs to be replaced timely, that uh, alerts you to all of the conditions that you should be alerted to, whether it's an old system or a new system, 
and helps you prioritize and in fact results in the prioritization of the best system to the worst system, if you will, so that we look at the worst system and then uh, in a matrix kind of concept, look at the worst system that could produce, produce the worst outcomes in whatever the area, it could be a security area, it could be a customer service area. Do we have a way of prioritizing things? So we're, we're sure that A, things don't fall through the crack, and B, those things that represent significant risks are in fact prioritized for addressing. Is there a system that does that as opposed to our happening based on conversations and so on to trip over? Mark, I know that you just raised your hand. You want to say something? Oh, carefully, though. Very carefully. <laughs> um, so we did start a system that has the capability to expand to the types of angles and facets that you're talking about for overall risk evaluation. We started it within the security space, and we're looking at various elements of cyber risk, but it's not from a technical perspective tied to just cyber. It can, it can include usability factors and, and population serve factors and things like that to apply risk rankings. Um, so we have, we have some experience with some aspect of that, but we have to partner very much so, I think, with the businesses to you know, really develop this sort of programmatic approach to including these other facets, facets of risk well, would that be useful to have? Because I, I get the impression that we, we, we almost find problems anecdotally. I think from where I asked Mark to step in, and the reason behind that is you're talking from, from my perspective, you're talking about investing within core IT platform and IT systems to allow for management and um, risk management that can avoid this in the future. And so I would love if we did that. I think that would be critically important to the future of Vermont and to the current state of Vermont. Yes. So what's the next step? Yeah, how do we make sure that happens? I think we need to have further conversations in this committee. To identify what I think it would be tremendously important. Because the thing that, that I think many of us worry about is you wake up in the morning and you read the paper. I know, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> and you find some disaster has happened that you never thought about, and you, nobody's working on it. Nobody else ever thought about it. I, I speak a lot to the team around, um, I want to get out of the reactive response business. I would like to run a proactive, automated, shop so that when the incidents come up that we do have to react and respond to, it's not, you know, we can't be in firefighting mode. We're not firefighters. Um, we're, we're engineers. We need to be engineers and see the firefighting to, to those experts. Well, I think one of the things perhaps that we can leave you with is the notion that a concept of how we identify these risks and how we prioritize them, like what we prioritize might be something that we pass to you and ask you to come back to us at some point in the future with your thoughts about how to do that. I would be happy to do that. Thank you. Leads into talking about our, our uh, next meetings. I, mean, uh, I, I lean towards uh, do something early in the session, um, maybe in the first week or two. Um, Secretary, do you know how long the RFP process for this will be? like a um, timeline for when we might have more information uh, that we could discuss openly. Let me get back to you on that because um, the RMP process itself, um, it will be a released RFP so they can speak about the requirements that they have and the expectations that they have. They just wouldn't be able to talk about the timing. So once it's awarded that from my experience can take anywhere from three to nine months. And I wouldn't want to wait nine months for this committee to hear um, the expectations from the business. Um, do you think uh, we'd be able to, in the first couple of weeks of session, um, talk about the requirements that have been identified and what they're looking for 
and um, perhaps a brief review of what the current state of the system is. We can work with the EHS team and the ZF team to, to do that. Yes. Okay. Um, typically, when we're in session, we have a hard time having large blocks of time. Um, so perhaps more uh, small, uh, like one hour sessions. So maybe this would be a good first meeting um, to talk about the, the AHS system. And then um, what I think I'd like is for the second one is a, kind of a review of uh, we had a matrix of all the state systems and how many uh, variants there were and which ones were green, which ones were yellow, which ones were red, maybe kind of bringing that back to play um, to discuss uh, the, the state of IT systems uh, in general. Um, given, given the security risk component of that, I would request consideration of an on executive session for that. Uh, before that? For that discussion. Okay. And we need to do UI review. Yes. Sounds like we already got three <laughs> meetings to book. <laughs> Did you have questions? I'm just thinking about where to carve out additional time. Yeah, historically, we've uh, had like 45 minute lunch sessions. Yeah. Uh, which I think that's probably. Or early times, or early after minutes, right? I mean, I don't know how soon the committees. Start with their intense work in the second year of biennium, yeah. but you would. Those of you who've been here longer immediately. Okay. okay. <laughs> um, and especially as uh, we're going to budget adjustment, and, uh, talking about trying to do that in the okay. first couple of weeks anyway. Yeah, my preference would be the 45 minute noon or an 8 a.m. I already have some regular 8 a.m. scheduled for. Some of us are in the rural caucus. Uh, would Friday lunches be a workable thing? Probably. Uh, does that work for you? <laughs> I'll make it work. Um, this is important. Do we want to try to do something the first week or wait for the second week? I will not be here the first week. Okay. I will not be here the second week. First week, we may get a better idea of yeah. our time availability. Um, like, would it be possible to, uh, well, what spaces are available? Um, we... that's, that's the thing. There's the room up in the 40s, which used to be the old energy and technology room which is Zoom capable and in the building. Yeah. Um, the, and then outside of that, there's really just the pavilion rooms, if they're available, if they're open, which I've heard that they are. We're getting over there and back on the lunch break. It's, yeah, um, I mean, it's easy for me to get to this room. Um, can if you can talk to the chair of this committee into letting you use this room okay. for Jai Talk, that's, that's something you can do as well. Okay. Good luck with that. <laughs> I, I, I mean, I might be able to. <laughs> Since you don't have to sit next to where you are. Um, so, uh, second week, Friday, uh, aim for well, aim for 12 o'clock, um, or do we need to go a little bit later? 12 10. 12. 12. 12. So, what are we trying to We're going to be late. Exactly. <laughs> are you trying for here? Yeah. Okay. And if it, no, uh, I'll check with Mike. And if it doesn't work, then we can go for the 40s. Okay. So, um, the, second, so the second week. What's the date for that one? The 12th. The 12th? Yeah. January 12th. The 12th at 12th. The 12th at 12th. Wow. That's it. Uh, Senator Chittenden, does that work for you? So I actually am um, going to be at a UVM obligation that day, that second week. So I, I will not be able to attend that meeting, and I'm sorry. Okay. I won't be there either. Okay. Sorry. Do you want to take a different day? A different day could be whatever. Anytime the week after would, would be fine. Yeah. <laughs> the Friday the week after is fine. <laughs> the, it, Senator Chittenden, is the whole week uh, blocked for you? 
the whole week is the worst week of my semester. Oh, it's a very, very busy week for me. The first week, I think the first week. Yeah. Understood. Um, Brooks Billia said she wouldn't be here the first week. Um, and I okay, was giving signals Friday. from the secretary okay. that maybe the first week wouldn't be so great either. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, third Friday? Yeah, third Friday. Uh, 26th. 22nd. Oh, the 19th? Yeah, yeah. yeah I'm in December. Look at all your Zenith for looking at December. 12 plus 7 would be 19th. Yeah. Yeah. In December. 19th would be great. The 19th? Yep. Yeah. I'm seeing nods. Let's go. Yep. Are we going to go for the 19th? Yeah, please. Sounds good. Zoom out so it's not everyone's calendars. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you. Um, and to clarify, we'll be aiming to discuss the um, cluster. So that would be my preference, but I don't know where UI is going to be in that moment. So if, I mean, I guess working with Lisa would be. Okay. Shall we leave the uh, agenda up in the air? And if UI is urgent, then we'll do that. If UI is not urgent, then we'll do the foster care. Any other? So that's 12 to 1 or making it? Let's, let's book, or, block the whole hour and um, yeah. Do we want to book other Fridays since it's going to get busy or not yet? Yeah. Why don't, why, yeah. Do you want to book the third Fridays? Is that enough meetings? Yeah, is one a month uh, enough? I was thinking at least, yeah. I was thinking maybe every other. Uh, I think every other is good. Some of us are on multiple committees, and I, I have a concern that that frequency is pretty heavy. That every other week is too frequent? I do. That's, that's my, my opinion based on other commitments. Uh, why don't we? I, I expect you all will make the decision, but I mean, my I, I guess my suggestion would be to start with a monthly and see. Okay. Um, okay. And uh, perhaps as a secretary, uh, we could ask you to uh, send us um, information uh, more frequently as it's available so we can review and make more efficient use of the meetings we do make. And maybe we can tailor information that yeah. we want from her also. So um, then let's uh, four weeks after the 19th is uh, let's put that on the calendar so it's at least third, a, third Friday. It's the third Friday. Well, oh, hmm. uh, the week after that would be the oh, third Friday, right? Oh, the 16th. 15th. The 16th will be the third Friday of February, okay. and four weeks after the 19th of January. Okay. Let's aim for that. Thank you. We good? We adjourned. Seeing thumbs up. Thank you, Secretary. I appreciate your time. Um, and